All right, welcome everyone to tonight's event in a debate between Dr. Jonathan McClatchy and Dr. Shabir Ali entitled, The Nature of God, Tawheed or Trinity. My name is Bryant Miller and I'll be moderating tonight's event. I received this honor by virtue of being president of the Sattler College Debate Club. Dr. McClatchy happens to be our faculty advisor and together we've been responsible for planning and hosting this debate. The goal of Sattler Debate Club is to equip its members with lifelong analytical and rhetorical skills, but also, and more importantly, we seek to hone our ability to discern truth from falsehood and defend the most important truths of all. This event is born from that desire, represented are the two largest religions in the world, Christianity and Islam. And the subject of the discussion is one of the most important distinctions between those two religions, the nature of God. It is our hope that this debate will spark conversations and wrestlings for all present, that it will inspire each of you to think more deeply about your faith. But we also hope that it will serve to strengthen the dialogue and mutual respect between Christians and Muslims, that it would be a bridge building rather than a bridge burning event. And I trust that given the friendship between Dr. McClatchy and Dr. Ali, that it will be just that. Although this event is sadly not in person, it would still not have been possible without Sattler College and all those involved in its creation. For those of you unfamiliar with Sattler, we are a small Christian college located in the heart of Boston. Sattler first opened its doors to its inaugural class, of which I am part, in the fall of 2018. Although Sattler does strive to equip its students academically, its primary goal is the growth and development of disciples of Jesus Christ, as exemplified by our tagline, equipping Jesus peaceful resolution. Again, I hope this event will contribute to that goal. But you didn't come to listen to me, so without further ado, I'll introduce the speakers and we'll begin. Dr. Jonathan McClatchy is a Christian scholar, international speaker and debater. He holds a bachelor's degree in forensic biology, a master's degree in evolutionary biology, a second master's degree in medical and molecular bioscience, and a PhD in in evolutionary biology. Currently, Jonathan is an assistant professor of biology at Sattler College in Boston, Massachusetts. He is also working on his MA in biblical studies at Southern Evangelical Seminary. Jonathan has been interviewed on podcasts and radio shows, including Unbelievable, on Christian, Premier Christian Radio, Line of Fire Radio, The One Minute Apologist, and many others. Jonathan has spoken internationally in Europe, North America, and South Africa, promoting an intelligent, reflective, and evidence-based Christian faith. Also with us is Dr. Shabira Lee, who holds an MA and PhD degree in Quranic interpretation from the University of Toronto, and a BA in religious studies from Laurentian University. He has taught courses at the University of Toronto on the Arabic language, Islamic studies, and interfaith relations. As a faith leader, he is, explains his faith in a weekly television program called Let the Quran Speak. He also travels internationally to deliver public lectures and participate in interfaith dialogue. The format for tonight's debate will be 20 minute opening statements for each speaker, followed by 12 minute rebuttals by each speaker, and then second rebuttals, six minutes each, followed by a 20 minute time for question and answers from you. So be getting ready. We'll be taking question and answers from, or excuse me, questions. Hopefully the debaters will be supplying the answers. <laughs> uh, taking questions from the YouTube live stream as well as uh, facilitating that uh, live questions here on Zoom as well. And then that will be followed by a 10 minute cross-examination for each and five minutes uh, for each closing statement. So without further ado, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, if you would uh, offer your opening statements. All right, well, it's great uh, honor to be here. I would like to begin by uh, thanking uh, the Sattler College's Debate Society, in particular, uh, it's President Brian Miller for organizing and facilitating this dialogue this evening. And I would also like to extend my thanks to Dr. Shabir Ali for agreeing to participate in this most important discussion this evening. 
This is my third debate with Shabir. Uh, though I've debated many Muslim apologists over the years, I have found none to be so erudite and thoughtful as Dr. Shabir Ali. And so I'm looking forward to an engaging and spirited discussion this evening. <clears throat> so without, without further ado, let me uh, launch into the topic of this evening's discussion. So today we're, talk, we're here to talk about the Trinity versus Tawheed, which are the two competing models, if you will, that are put forward by Christianity and Islam respectively. Let me just start by doing some definitional work. So the doctrine of the Trinity is uh, the proposition that there is one divine essence and three distinctive persons that together share in that divine essence. So there's the Father, there's the Son, there's the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit. There's three distinctive individuals who nonetheless participate and share in that divine essence. And then the Islamic model that they're putting forward this evening is Tawheed which is the proposition that God is absolutely one, both with respect to being and with respect to person. So the question that I want to address uh, in our short time together um, in my opening statement is which of those models best accounts for all the relevant data? So Islam and Christianity both claim to be continuations of the Abrahamic tradition. Therefore, both religions predict that their concept of God is consistent with that revealed by the Hebrew Bible. Thus, we must consider which of the two models under consideration in this debate, Trinity or Tawheed, best accounts for all of the data in the Hebrew Bible. Now, I would argue that God has always revealed himself as being a monotheistic God, and Shabir Ali will agree wholeheartedly with this assessment. Deuteronomy 6, 4, uh, Hear, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And it's the famous uh, Jewish Shema. And then uh, another passage, Isaiah 40 through 10, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and, and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. And so um, all throughout the, the Old and New Testaments, we see this emphatic declaration of monotheism. Christianity and Islam are monotheistic religions. And so this uh, um, fits with the predictions of both uh, Trinity and Tawheed as to what we will find when we open up our Hebrew Bibles. Now, um, as we just read Deuteronomy 6, 4, which says, Shema o Israel, Yahweh Elokeinu, um, Yahweh um, Echad, um, the, the, um, the Lord is one, um, the Lord is, um, um, Yahweh is one, um, is, is God. The Hebrew word Echad there that's used for, um, for one, for the oneness of God, allows for, but it does not require, I want to be clear about that, it does not require a composite unity. Um, Genesis 1.5 says, um, for example, the Yom, uh, it speaks about the, the Yom Akkad, or the first day, or day one, which is a combination of two things, the evening and the morning. Genesis 2.24, Adam and Eve become one flesh, again, using the Hebrew word echad there. Genesis 3.22, Adam and Eve become one with God, and again, using the Hebrew word echad. Genesis 11.6, the people were one, again, using the, the Hebrew word echad. Genesis 34, the Shechemites wanted to become one people with the Jews. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 12, God gave the people one heart, lev echad. Ezra 2.64, the congregation of 42,360 persons was described as one. Jeremiah 32.39, under the new covenant, God will give his people one heart, again, lev echad. So you can see that the Hebrew word echad, when used in certain contexts, can allow for a, a compound or composite unity, a unity that, um, um, where you have a, a, um, a diversity in oneness. So let's look to other passages in the Hebrew Bible where we see not just uh, information about the oneness of God, but also divine plurality within the divine essence. So for example, in Zechariah chapter two, we read, um, this is just written shortly after the return of the exiles from Babylon, up, up, flee from the land of the north, that would be Babylon, declares the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord, up, escape to Zion, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon, for thus said the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you. For he who touches you uh, touches the apple of his eye. Behold, I will shake my hand over them, and they shall become plunder for those who serve them. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, o, o daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell in your midst and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. So here we have Yahweh being sent by Yahweh, which implies that there are two individuals in this text who are identified as Yahweh. 
and Yahweh has saying, you will know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. That is very consistent with the Trinitarian perspective, which I'm representing this evening, not so consistent with the Tawhid perspective represented by um, my partner in dialogue this evening. Let's take another example, Isaiah 48. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. Listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, whom I called. I am he, I am the first and I am the last. My hand laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I called to them, they stand forth together. Assemble all of you and listen. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He shall perform his purpose in Babylon and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken and called him. I have brought him and he will prosper in his way. Draw near to me, hear this. From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time I came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. So again, Yahweh is being sent along with the spirit of Yahweh by Yahweh. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord, your God, and so forth. And so it's, it, it continues that the whole thrust of the passage is that Yahweh is speaking and he has been sent by Yahweh along with the spirit of Yahweh. Another example from the book of Isaiah, chapter 63, verse 7 through 10. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness to the house of Israel, that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. So there you have God the Father. He's represented as a father to his people, a very common theme throughout the Bible. And he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. Now, the word angel there is the word melach, which doesn't actually always denote um, a, an angelic creature that can refer to that. But more broadly, it refers to a messenger. For example, Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, his name is the possessive form of melach, meaning my messenger. So the messenger of his presence saved them, which, of course, is an allusion back to Exodus 23, 20 and 21, where the angel of the Lord is described as um, having as possessing the very presence of God and having the prerogative to forgive sins and indeed to withhold forgiveness of sins. And, and it continues, in his love and his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. So the grieving of the Holy Spirit there indicates a personal agency. Impersonal forces are not grieved. This indicates the Holy Spirit is a person and uh, he's and, it, and also in Psalm 78, verse 40, it says, how often they rebelled against him, speaking about Yahweh, in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Um, and so uh, the Holy Spirit there is, um, is spoken of in the very same terms that Yahweh is spoken of in Psalm 78, 40. So I would argue this shows a plurality of divine persons, namely the Father, his messenger, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also represented by the Hebrew Bible as being a distinctive identity, a distinctive person. In Isaiah 48, verse 16, for example, it says, draw near to me, hear this, from the beginning I'm not spoken in secret, from the time it came to be I have been there, and now the Lord God has sent me and his Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has been sent by Yahweh, which indicates that he's got his distinctive identity. Psalm 104, verse 30, also, when you send forth your Spirit, they are created. So the Spirit, again, is sent forth from Yahweh, indicating, again, his personal identity, his personal distinctiveness. He's also specifically um, called the Spirit of God in many passages throughout the Bible. There's just um, a list of some of them. He's um, also ascribed characteristics and attributes of deity. So, for example, the ability to create in Job, Job 33, verse 4, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Psalm 104, verse 30, um, when you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. He's omniscient. Isaiah 40, verse 13, who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Um, there are um, other characteristics of deity, including a, a tremendous power. In Job 14, verse 6, and the spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the line in pieces as one tears a young goat. Isaiah 11, verse 2, the spirit of the Lord to rest upon him, speaking of the Messiah, the spirit of counsel and might. Zechariah 4, verse 6, and he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. He's also omnipresent. Psalm 139, verse 7, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? Um, he's also, the spirit is also, we're told, responsible for the divine work of providence. In Job 34, verse 13 through 15, it says, who, made, who gave him charge over the earth? 
and who laid on him the whole world? If he should set his heart to it and gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. So he's responsible for the divine work of providence. He also was said to inspire the scriptures. The spirit of um, 2 Samuel 23, verse 2 and 3 says, The spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. And then notice the Hebrew parallelism in the next verse. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me. And in Hebrew, the parallelism is where you have a, um, a description in one line, and then the next line says the same thing in different words. And so the spirit of the Lord is another way of speaking of the God of Israel, according to that text. Zechariah 7, verse 12. They, it, they made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words that the Lord of hosts has sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. Nehemiah 9 verse 30 also says, many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through the prophets and so forth. So we've already seen the deity and personal identity of the Holy Spirit. Now let's talk about the deity of Israel's Messiah, according to the Hebrew Bible. In Daniel 7, 13 and 14, we see, and by the way, in the context, verse 9, it says, as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took a seat. So notice the plural thrones, indicating these are two individual persons that are in view here, the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. Daniel 7 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the cloud of, clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom one, which will not be destroyed. Now, notice that um, worship is ascribed to the Son of Man figure in Daniel 7. In fact, the Greek Septuagint translation of Daniel 7, 14 uses the Greek word latrevo when describing the services to be rendered to the Son of Man. In fact, um, every time that it appears, this word appears in the book of Daniel, which is eight other times, it's always used in a religious context, dealing with service or worship to a deity. Um, so the Trevo actually denotes the very highest form of worship and religious service, a kind that is to be ascribed only to Yahweh. Um, the Aramaic term in the original is, uh, is Pelach, which again is a type of divine service, uh, which in a religious context, uh, serving a divine being translates into worship. Also notice in the previous chapter, in Daniel 6, verse 25 and 26, we read the words of King Darius after Daniel's been delivered from the lion's den. King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed and his dominion will never end. The same language that's applied to the Son of Man in the very next chapter. Another text where we read about the, uh, the, the divine identity of the, of the coming Messiah is in Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government should be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace, and so forth. And so um, notice this, this, this phrase, this expression, Wonderful Counselor, is used of Yahweh in Isaiah 28, verse 29, where it says, this also comes from the Lord of hosts, he is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. The phrase mighty God, again, is used of Yahweh in Isaiah, the very next chapter, Isaiah 10, 21. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God, the El Gabor, the very same expression. And it's significant that the word for God here is not Elohim, which may be used in a lower sense for those who are representatives of God, such as Moses in, in Exodus 7, 1, for example. But the, rather, the term here is El a term that's never used by Isaiah or for that matter, any other Old Testament writer in any lower sense than that of absolute deity. Another example is um, the, uh, in the book of Zechariah chapter nine, nine through 12, where we read about the triumphal entry on, and procession of the Messiah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold of prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. Now notice that in uh, this messianic individual gets to be king over all the earth. Whereas in Zechariah 14, verse 9, 
we read about, um, so in the context, Yahweh has descended, his feet have touched the men of olives. Notice Yahweh, by the way, has physical feet that physically touch the men of olives, causing the men of olives to split in two, resulting in a valley for the people to flee through. And, uh, and in verse nine, it says, Yahweh will be king over all the earth. And that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. But we just read in chapter nine, that the mess messianic king gets to be king over all the earth. Well, that makes sense if, uh, the, if Yahweh is the messianic king. In Zephaniah 3 also, which links again to this, we read a, a parallel text to that we read in, Ze in Zechariah 9. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Sound familiar? The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, so just as there was a king of Israel in Zechariah 9, so there is a king of Israel in Ze Zephaniah 3. The Lord, Yahweh, is in your midst. You shall never again for evil. Also, verse 20 of this same text parallels Zechariah 9, because Zechariah 9 had said that God will restore to them double. Verse 20 of Zephaniah 3 says, at that time, I will bring you in. At that time, when I gather you together, I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth, when I will restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. So again, we see very clear intertextuality going on. And the king here is the Lord God himself. We also see the messenger of the covenant, who I would argue is identified as the Messiah. In Malachi 3, verse 1, we read, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to this temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who is the messenger of the covenant? And notice, by the way, this individual is given the, the, the title Ha'adon, which is never used um, in any lower sense than that of absolute deity in the Hebrew Bible. But who is this messenger of the covenant? Well, in Judges 2, verse 1, we read, that the angel of the Lord, remember that figure we read about in Isaiah 63 um, and, and Exodus uh, 23. Um, and so it says, the angel of the Lord went out from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. So here we see that the angel of the Lord is the angel of the covenant, the messenger of the covenant. And the messenger of the Lord, we see, has authority to forgive sins. For example, in Exodus 23, verse 20 and 21, Behold, I send an angel before you, and this is the text that Isaiah 63 um, is echoing, to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. So he has the authority, the prerogative to forgive sins, and the reason for that is because God's very name dwells in him. Uh, Zechariah 3, likewise, also indicates that the messenger of the Lord has the authority to forgive sins. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing in his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Notice this also points to the plurality of divine person within the, within the divine essence or substance, because we've got Yahweh speaking, invoking Yahweh as though it's another person. Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments, and the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments, and so forth. We see various passages throughout the Old Testament where the uh, messenger of the Lord is ascribed divine titles and attributes. For example, Genesis 31, 13, in the context is the angel of the Lord speaking to Jacob. He says, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Um, we also see in Genesis 48, another example of parallelism, the God before whom I, this is where Joseph, um, Jacob, Jacob is blessing the sons of Joseph, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel or the messenger who's redeemed me from all evil, may he, and notice a singular pronoun, may he bless the boys. In conclusion then, we've seen that Christianity and Islam both claim to be continuations of the Abrahamic tradition, Therefore, both religions predict that their concept of God is consistent with that revealed by the Hebrew Bible. Of the two models under consideration in tonight's debate, Trinity and Tawhid, Trinitarianism we've seen best accounts for the data that we have considered. And I'll uh, close with that and hand over to my colleague Shabir. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you, Dr. McClatchy. And uh, Dr. Ali, you may now present your opening statements. I 
I believe you're still muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, so for some reason I was unable to set my timer, but uh, you'll give me reminders, please, Bryant. Yes, I can do that. Would you like a reminder it halfway through? Um, yes, let me, let me see one more time if I can do this. Timer, set, save, something went wrong. Okay, so yeah, may maybe 10 minutes and then the five minutes. And, okay, and, and, I'll do that. And count down from there, like, you know, two minutes, one minute, zero, <laughs> okay. cut off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Will do. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone, and uh, I'm so glad to be in this forum with you here today. I thank um, Jonathan for giving me this uh, opportunity to have this dialogue with him and uh, Brian for hosting uh, Sattler College uh, for putting this all together, or at least the debating club at Sattler College. Uh, thank you all. I begin by praising our creator and fashioner, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and asking to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets, his messengers, all of the righteous people of all time. I ask him to bless you all tonight, bless uh, all of your loved ones. And uh, I ask him to keep us safe, keep the world safe, and uh, to continue to bless us with uh, his guidance, uh, including in our meeting here uh, tonight. I pray that our meeting will be a fruitful one, uh, one that will help us to uh, better understand each other as people of faith, uh, even if our faiths are different. Uh, a, a meeting, I hope this will be, uh, that will help us uh, to have more build, bridges built between Muslims and Christians so that together we can work uh, for a more peaceful uh, world, a world that is uh, filled with moral principles uh, and uh, a, a world in which uh, the youth in particular are being guided towards uh, things which are good and pleasing to God. I'm so delighted to be back uh, uh, having this engagement with uh, uh, Dr. McClatchy. Uh, the last time, uh, I can't remember when it was, it was many, many years ago. I can remember the venue in, in London, uh, England. Um, and since then, he has gone ahead to uh, acquire his uh, PhD uh, designation. And uh, I'm so glad that he has studied biology because I'm sure that his work in that area, especially, uh, will be helpful to both Muslims and Christians in presenting reasons for believing in God, uh, even in an age of uh, science. Uh, so for uh, tonight's uh, dialogue, uh, I'm also uh, hopeful that as the evening unfolds, I will learn more and more uh, from him, even uh, about the Bible and uh, Christian approaches to the Bible. Now, as for the topic itself, um, Trinity our, our Tawheed, I would put it in a simple manner and ask uh, that our, our question is really, uh, is God a simply one or is he a one in three or, or three in one? Let me explain the word Tawheed to uh, begin with. Uh, the word Tawheed uh, in, in Arabic comes from the word uh, one. Uh, so Tawheed means to consider something one, at least in a Muslim religious context. Uh, so the idea of Tawheed is, to, is that we consider God to be one and everything we do, all of our practices must reflect the idea that we believe uh, that there is only one God. Uh, so we might say then that our dialogue tonight is uh, almost a dialogue between uh, uh, Trinitarians and Unitarians, almost within Christianity. Of course, I'll bring a Muslim favor, uh, a Muslim flavor to this, uh, but we can see the same sort of dialogue going on uh, between uh, uh, Trinitarian Christians and Unitarian Christians. And we can also see a similar dialogue going on between the Trinitarian Christians and, uh, and, and Jews who uh, nowadays are uh, largely Unitarians. Uh, so to contrast the two views, as uh, Jonathan has rightly pointed out, the Trinitarian view says that there are uh, three persons in, in one God, and um, the Unitarian view says that there is only one God, period, that's it. We don't need to distinguish between person and, and being, or person and substance, because uh, for us there is only one God, period. Uh, now, uh, for my uh, dialogue tonight, I would like to structure it in a slightly different way, I, I, my presentation at least, uh, than the way that Jonathan went. Jonathan went into the Old Testament at length 
uh, to say that uh, it, whichever of these two religions uh, has the right concept uh, must have a concept that accounts for all of the evidence in the Old uh, Testament. I, I see a lot of benefit in that, and I will come back to address that uh, uh, at the beginning with the uh, last few minutes of my talk here uh, today uh, before going into the rebuttal sessions. Uh, for my opening presentation, however, I'd like to uh, advance uh, uh, my, my ideas under three broad headings, uh, under text, history, and reason. Now, now you will uh, notice that uh, text starts with T, uh, history starts with H, and reason starts with R. So that gives us THR, the first three letters that uh, spell the word three. Uh, so that might be an easy way to remember what my talk was all about. So text, history, and reason. So as for the Islamic uh, view of, of monotheism, our idea is that that monotheism uh, comes out of the text of the Quran. And so the text forms the basis of everything we, we believe and we practice. It's almost like Protestant principle of saying uh, scripture alone. Uh, so we, we want to make sure that that's in the text. Now, in the Quran, there are multiple texts that insist that uh, there is only one God. For example, what is called the Kalima of Islam or the basic creed of Islam is La ilaha illallah. There is no God but uh, God. And that is mentioned in, in the Quran. Uh, so we, we have very clear statements, multiple statements. This uh, a, a statement to the effect that there's no God but God in that simple, uh, clear, declarative style uh, is, uh, you know, throughout the Quran, some 37 times uh, that uh, uh, phrase occurs, uh, especially, especially in the form, uh, la ilaha illahu, there is no God but him, when it is clear that God is the uh, subject uh, uh, th that is being referred to. Uh, so, uh, now, as for uh, the history, uh, over history, naturally, ideas uh, uh, flow and, and, and ebb, and uh, we find this in all religions. In fact, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine that there is a religion in which uh, the, there has not been continual discourse, evolution, and change. But we see that despite uh, changes that have occurred in the Islamic faith over time, the one thing that remained quite constant is the idea that there is only one uh, God. And, and that's the God that we refer to in the Arabic as Allah. Uh, Allah is uh, a combination, it seems, of Al and Ilah, uh, Al being the definite article and Ilah being God. So it's the God. But this has become combined into what is used as a personal name uh, for the one and only true God uh, in the Muslim faith, uh, which we consider to be the same as the God of Abraham, uh, Moses, and Jesus, the God of the Bible and uh, of the uh, Quran. Uh, we might add a comparative note here and say that the Arabic word ilah has been traced back to il uh, of the uh, Babylonians, il, and uh, il has uh, also been connected to el in Hebrew, uh, which is the name of God in the Bible. And as you heard Jonathan say, uh, this is the name that is used uh, of God and of no one else uh, in, in the Bible. So that's an interesting uh, correspondence there. Now, a plural uh, form of El uh, starts with uh, its, uh, its uh, uh, sister uh, term, which is Elo, and uh, Elo becomes Elohim in, 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 in the plural. And we know from the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Elohim created the heavens and the earth. In the Arabic translation of the Bible, uh, we will find uh, in the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. So we know from this uh, that uh, Allah in Arabic is the same as, as Elohim in, in the Bible and uh, the same as El also in, in the Bible. We're referring to the same one uh, God. Now, in Islamic history, uh, uh, Muslims have uh, thought about the attributes of God, and the idea was that God is not a composite being. Uh, he is a, he's a simple one being uh, with, with no parts. Uh, so what do we say about uh, things like the mercy of God, the power of God, and, and so on? Uh, could we say that these are different aspects of God in a way that will compromise the unity? So if we say uh, that uh, we're appealing to the mercy of God, uh, does that mean that there is God uh, and God's mercy 
Uh, and if we think of all of the 99 names of God in the Islamic tradition, does that mean that God is a composite of 99 uh, different entities? So Muslim scholars debated this in our past, but by now uh, it has settled down to uh, something that you know, belongs in antiquity at a time when people uh, disputed you know, how many angels could dance on the head of a pin and so on, and other uh, matters which bear little relevance to the faith and practice of Muslims uh, today. Uh, so we, we see that uh, a lot uh, of the discussion has uh, been uh, due to mis misunderstandings over nomenclature and you know how people name things and and how they reify uh, things which did not need to be reified. They personified uh, things which do not need to be personified. So in short, Muslims will say that yes, God has attributes, uh, both the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran, but the attributes themselves uh, are not persons in Godhead uh, as comparable with uh, the Trinity idea of uh, three persons and the one God and the one Godhead. Uh, so there's just one God, God has many attributes, but, but these are not separate entities and there's still only one God and God is not composed of parts. Uh, they, uh, along the same lines, uh, people talked about uh, the uh, the Quran as the Kalam or the speech of God is the, is the Quran uh, a separate entity of, uh, from God. And now, of course, the Quran is in our hands, uh, written with ink and, and on paper. So people asked, uh, can we say that the Quran is, uh, is something other than God? And, and sometimes to be cautious, people said, well, it's neither God nor other than God. And so there is some vagueness about how some people thought about the Quran. But I think that after the dust of that debate has settled as well, it is now common to find that Muslims will uh, either not speak about this or they might say uh, that, uh, well, uh, the Quran is an expression of the uh, thoughts of God and the thoughts of God uh, are eternal. Uh, but uh, the uh, Quran is a temporal expression of the thought of God. Of course, uh, what makes this different from the Christian Trinitarian view is that the Quran is not a person having its own separate words, who speaks his own words. If you take by comparison the idea of Jesus being the word of God, and then Jesus speaks his own words, then if the word of God became a man, uh, and, and that is also in a way God, then what about the words of Jesus? Would that be also in a way God? So in the, the simple answer to that from Muslims is that when we speak about the words of God in this way, uh, we say that's a message from God that reflects the eternal thoughts of God, uh, but uh, is not itself a separate and distinct entity uh, from God. Dr. Lee. So, Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to let you know you have just under nine minutes. Under nine minutes? Okay, good. So I'll, I'm, I'm... I'll, I'll update you in the chat from now on. Sorry. To, and, sorry uh, to okay, sure. Okay. Uh, no, no, no harm if you interrupt me. It's not a, not, not a problem because I probably won't pay attention to the chat, but I'll hear your interruption. Okay. So uh, now coming to um, a reason. Uh, so from the Muslim point of view, uh, the, the idea of belief in God is very, a very reasonable doctrine. When we think about the philosophical arguments for the existence of God, uh, the very question itself, is there a God, implies that we're talking about the probability that there is a God, a singular God. And, and the proofs, uh, whether we talk about the ontological argument for the existence of God uh, or the cosmological argument, uh, the... Uh, teleological argument, the moral argument for the existence of God, we're always thinking of arguments which uh, lead to the idea that there is a God. And uh, it, it will take another step, another argument to, to, to show that uh, God is one in three or something of this nature. So from a Muslim point of view, the, the Muslim idea that there is only one God, period, uh, is a very reasonable doctrine. Now, I'd like to ask the same three uh, questions about uh, the, the Christian Trinitarian view. And this time, I'd like to take them in reverse order. You will recall that I'm using as an acronym the first three letters of the word three, T-H-R, T for text, H for history, and R for reason. So I would start with the R for, for reason in the reverse order now. And I would say that from a Muslim point of view, the Trinitarian doctrine seems to us to be uh, uh, quite elusive. Uh, so when, when we hear our Christian friends, like for example, Jonathan said that there is one God and this one God part, like they, 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 there are three persons in the one God and the three persons participate and share in the same substance. So now we, I start to wonder, is this substance a fourth entity? 
And in that case, what do we call that fourth entity? Is that not God? Uh, and, and is that not greater than the three who participate in, in that one? Um, and so why do we not have four, entity, uh, four entities? And, and, and so we have reasonable uh, difficulties that arise when we start thinking about uh, the Christian Trinitarian uh, concept from the point of view of reason. Of reason. And uh, if, we, if we think about that, we, we now uh, want to know when we come to the texts of the scripture, are we going to interpret it in a way that arrives at, a, at an unreasonable uh, outcome? Or are we going to interpret the text in a way that arrives at uh, reasonable outcomes? And I think it is a hermeneutical principle that is uh, well established uh, in, in, in general, uh, that we, you know, when interpreting the, the words of any uh, writer, we interpret it in the, in the context of uh, that writer's time and place, but also uh, given the presupposition that the writer is going to tell us intelligible things. And, and we, we should not interpret the writer's words in a, in a way that uh, re- leads to a kind of in, unintelligible uh, conclusion. So, so much uh, for reason. We'll, we'll have a chance to explore more aspects of that. But coming to the history now. Uh, looking at Christian history, we see that there has been a series of developments uh, leading to the, uh, uh, de- to, to the uh, declaration that God is a trinity. Uh, we can see this in the Christian creeds. I know that Sattler College is committed to following the uh, creeds of the, of the apostles and, uh, and uh, of Nicaea. Well, you know, the two are not the same thing. The, the, the uh, Council of Nicaea, let's start there. So Council of Nicaea, we have actually two uh, declarations, one from the year 325, and then the Council of Constantinople, which revised this in the year 381. What was the key revision that was made in 381? It was the addition of the line that we worship the Holy Spirit along with the Father and the Son. So that means that in the year 325, not much thought was given to uh, declaring that uh, the Holy Spirit is worshipped along with the Father and the Son. So there's a later development. It had to be added in later. But now let's go back to the to the Apostles' Creed from the second century. So this is Dr. Uh, you just have under five under five minutes. Sure, good. Uh, so we go to the Apostles' Creed from the second century, and we see that in the Apostles' Creed, uh, Jesus is is not declared to be the Almighty God. He is declared to be the Son of God. But there is only one God, the, the Father, the Almighty. So we can see that in the Apostles' Creed from the second century, there is one God. God, the Father, the Almighty. In the uh, uh, Nicene Creed, 325, early 4th century, uh, we have the Father and the Son as gods, uh, or as persons in, in, in the Godhead, uh, two uh, persons. And then in the uh, uh, late 4th century, we have the Council of Constantinople, the second Nicene Creed, we might call that, adding the worship of the Holy Spirit. So now we have the three who are clearly being worshipped, and therefore we have three persons in, in the Godhead. You see a development here. And we can see that uh, uh, development also in in the text of of the Bible. Now, coming to the New Testament uh, text, uh, we can see that there are developments. To to start with, it should be very clear uh, that none of the writers of the New Testament so clearly and uh, in in a simple declarative manner manner, uh, says that Jesus is God in any way that is similar to the Old Testament declaring that Yahweh is the only God. In the New Testament, uh, the most you will find is that in the writings of Paul, uh, John, and and in Hebrews, uh, that Jesus is the agent through which God created everything else. So when we look up uh, to our creator, what we see, we see Jesus. But above him, there is another one who is his uh, origin and and, uh, because of whom he lives. So Jesus can say in John's gospel, I live because of the Father. And uh, uh, Paul can say there is only one God, the Father, and one Lord. Jesus Christ, hence making a distinction between God uh, and, and Jesus. And this is just after Paul had said there is no God but one. So uh, for Paul, there is only one God who is the Father, and, and, and Jesus is somehow subordinate to that uh, God. But above us, he is our Lord, and he is the uh, source or the conduit through which God created everything else. So uh, given this, we can see that uh, there is a development uh, from starting with uh, how Jesus is represented in Mark's gospel to the way in which he's represented in John's gospel. Uh, Many scholars believe that Mark is the earliest of the four gospels. John is widely 
uh, acknowledged to be the last of the four. And we can see a development where, for example, John's gospel is the only one that says that Jesus is the logos of God. And Christians make a, 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 a lot of a, a good points about this, that if he's the logos of God, then he must be uh, somehow uh, closely associated with God and so on. But notice that that point comes only from John's declaration uh, that Jesus was the logos of God. And it's a declaration that's not in the previous uh, gospels. And in fact, it is one that John himself does not sustain. You don't find in the rest of the gospel that anyone ca calls Jesus the Logos or Jesus declares himself to be the Logos uh, or that John himself is uh, continues to say, well, you know, this is the Logos of God going about saying these things and doing these things. In fact, we, we go to the letters of the, of, of the John in school and we see that first John begins at the beginning again, just like uh, John chapter one begins at the beginning. And uh, there, uh, the, the, the logos is not given this technical meaning of Dr. the- you have about reason, a minute remaining. Okay, a, a, of the reason of God uh, now becoming a man and so on. Here, the logos has more a kind of an ordinary meaning. So we can see then that there is a development in the way in which Jesus has been represented. And uh, in order for us to uh, uh, come to terms with uh, all of the evidence that is there in, in the Bible, uh, we need to um, pay attention to the text, the history, and the reason. First of all, uh, from the point of view of reason, we cannot interpret a text that gives us uh, uh, an unreasonable uh, result. Uh, second, uh, we have to see the history that this was a developing idea over time, so it'll be, it be anachronistic to read these ideas back into the early texts. And uh, third, when we look at the text, we see indeed there is this kind of development similar to the development we, we noticed in history. And when we realize that, we see that we have to peel back to the earliest representative representations of Jesus, in which Jesus declares that he is a servant and messenger of the one true God, as in John chapter 17, verse number three. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. And uh, we'll now move to rebuttal times. So each, each speaker will have 12 minutes for the first rebuttal. And uh, Dr. McClatchy, you're up. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Shabir, for that engaging uh, opening statement. Uh, let me uh, summarize uh, Dr. Shabir's uh, three uh, arguments, and then we will uh, unpack each one. So he gave us uh, the text of scripture, which is T, and then history for H, and then R for reason. So let me uh, address some of these points. I'll deal, first of all, with the text of scripture as it pertains to the Bible in particular. Uh, that he brought up, especially at the end of his opening statement. So he brought, he, uh, he talked, for example, about um, John's gospel is the only gospel that says Jesus is at the Logos of God. And you don't find anywhere else in John's gospel that anyone considers him to be the Logos um, or the divine word or God himself. And I, I would disagree very uh, strongly with that. We can look at various texts uh, in the gospel of John, which actually uh, present Jesus as um, a, a fully divine person. Um, all the way through. So for example, in John 1, we read, um, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Uh, he was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not overcome it. Notice in verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It's a very emphatic declaration of the deity of Christ. Um, even, if, uh, even if that wasn't um, secure, which it is, um, we can go up to verse 14 in that same chapter, which says the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Now that's an allusion to the Old Testament. For example, if you, if you continue reading on, we learn that uh, um, John the Baptist uh, quotes from when he's asked who he is to identify um, what he has to say about himself. He quotes from Isaiah 40, verse 3. I am the, um, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, if it turns out, if you go over to Isaiah 40, um, verse number th uh, 3, um, it's, that's what it says. And then verse 5 um, says, and the glory of the Lord, the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so um, that then provides the backdrop to what John says in John 1, 14. All, um, have, we, we have all seen his glory. 
just as Isaiah 40 verse 3 says, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. So there is um, a very, very clear statement as to the deity of Christ in John. Furthermore, in John chapter uh, 12, we have um, in, in verse... Uh, and when describing the unbelief of the people, verse 37, 38, and so forth, though he had done many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that a word, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom is the arm of the Lord been revealed? Which is from Isaiah 53. Therefore, they could not believe, for again, Isaiah said, he is blind in their eyes and hard in their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. And notice verse 41, as I said these things, because he saw his glory, the antecedent of his is Jesus, saw his glory and spoke of him. Whose glory did as I see, because he just quoted from Isaiah 6, he's blind in their eyes and hard in their hearts. Whose glory did as I see in that chapter? Well, it's interesting in the Greek Septuagint translation, which John has in view here, um, it actually says that the whole temple was filled with his glory in verse 1 of Isaiah 6. And so, um, John is identifying Jesus as the one whom Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6. Um, in John 20, verse 28, famously, Jesus, um, Thomas says to Jesus, having been shown the prints of the nails um, and spear went wind in, his, in Jesus' sign following the resurrection, he says, the, um, my Lord and my God even uses the article there. It literally is translated, the Lord of me and the God of me. Um, so that's uh, John. We could, we could talk about John's gospel for, for a long time. What about the development, though, that should be alleged in regards to the, the supposed evolving Christology from Mark through to John. Well, even in the first chapter of Mark's gospel, we see um, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, and he actually combines uh, Malachi 3 verse 1, Isaiah 40 verse 3, and there's possibly also Exodus 23, 20 in there as well. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Um, so it's quoting from Isaiah 40, verse 3, which is talking about the way being prepared for Yahweh himself to come. And uh, in verse 4, it says, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism for repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He's the one who's preparing the way for a certain someone. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were bringing out to him and being baptized in the river Jordan, confessing their sins and so forth. And then verse 7, it says, he preached, saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I. This is the one whose way is being prepared for. The strap of his sandals I'm not worthy to step down and untie. Verse 9, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. He is the one whose way is preparing the way for. But according to Isaiah 40, verse 3, it's actually Yahweh. And actually Malachi 3, verse 1 is also in view there in Mark chapter uh, 1, verse uh, the first three verses. And that also identifies uh, that uh, messenger of the covenant whose way is being, pre being prepared for as uh, Ha'adon, a divine title. We can look at um, Matthew's gospel. Um, so, for example, in Matthew 11, verse, uh, uh, verse 10, speaking about John the Baptist, Jesus says, This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. He's quoting from Malachi 3, verse 1. And he says, Truly, I say to you, and he talks about John the Baptist um, and as being the, the fulfillment of Malachi 3, verse 1 and Jesus being the one whose way was prepared for, and ergo, Jesus is presenting himself as Yahweh. We can talk about this for a long, long time. Um, what about, um, so he, he mentioned uh, that um, nobody in the New Testament says Jesus is God as clearly as the way in which the Old Testament says that Yahweh is God in the Old Testament. Jesus is represented as the agent through whom Jesus created everything else. Um, well, there's plenty of evidence that could refute this as well. For example, um, in Hebrews 1, 10 through 12, um, the author quotes from Psalm 102, verse 25 through 27, speaking about the Son of the Son, he says, um, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth. And in the context of Psalm 102, the, the Lord there is Yahweh. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe, you will roll them up, like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will have no end. Uh, in fact, verse 10 uses the word um, uh, kurios, which is the same word that's used in the Greek Septuagint to denote Yahweh in those passages. And in the context of quoting the Old Testament concerning Yahweh, it's very clear what the point that the author is trying to convey is. Um, to take another example, consider Paul's quotation of Joel 2, verse 32 in, um, in, uh, in uh, Romans 10, 13. For everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. Um, that alludes again to the Old Testament text that concerns Yahweh. Uh, but Paul introduces that text only a few verses after Paul declared 
that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the implication is that kurios of verse 9 is the same referent as in verse 13, namely Jesus. So in other words, Jesus is the Yahweh of Joel 2, verse 32, on whose name we are to call. And that point actually is drawn out even more explicitly by Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, um, which says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, again echoing Joel 2. Um, so again, the text clearly alludes to uh, that text, um, except the, the kurios, the Lord upon which we are to call, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And we could go on for some time. What about uh, the uh, alleged development in the, in the uh, Apostles' Creed? Uh, so turning to history, um, so the, he mentions the, uh, the, the, Council, the, the Council of Nicaea actually has two declarations, which is absolutely correct. You've got the Council of Nicaea in 325, and then you've got the Council of Constantinople in 381. And he notes that the latter adds uh, the, the Holy Spirit. And so you see this development. But the point of the whole point of the Council of Nicaea was to combat and refute the heresy of Arius, who denied uh, the, uh, the deity of, uh, of the Son. And so that's, that's why the, the Nicene Creed is emphatic about the deity of uh, the Son, um, because it was combating that particular heresy that arose uh, by, and by Arius. Um, and furthermore, when we look at uh, the um, early church, we see that there are plenty of uh, texts which um, deify both the Father um, and sorry, both the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three of those individuals. So, for example, um, we can look at um, we could look at Ignatius, we could look at Justin Martyr, we could we could look at um, um, Irenaeus. There, there's there's so many uh, um, examples. Uh, so, for example. Um, um, Aristides, the Christians trace the beginning of their religion to Jesus the Messiah. He is called the Son of the Most High God. It said that God came down from heaven. He assumed flesh and clothed himself with it from a Hebrew virgin, and the Son of God lived in the daughter of man. Um, another example, this is from the letter to Diognetus, one of my favorite uh, early uh, Christian letters. Truly God himself, who is almighty, the creator of all things and invisible, has sent from heaven and placed among men the one who is the truth and the holy and incomprehensible word. God did not, as one might have imagined, send to mankind any servant, angel, or ruler. Rather, he sent the very creator and fashioner of all things, by whom he made the heavens. As a king sends his son, who is also a king, so God sent him, he sent him as God. Um, uh, um, second Clement, brethren, it is fitting that you should think of Jesus Christ as of God, as the judge of the living and the dead. Um, <clears throat> um, we have... Um, uh, Justin Martyr, who says, um, um, the, the father of the universe has a son, and he, being the first begotten word of God, is even God. Uh, we have um, many other examples of, Old Test of, of um, early church writers who talk about the, um, the, the deity of Christ, and indeed the deity of the Holy Spirit. We can see that Trinitarian language um, well before uh, the creeds of the church. So I, I don't see the, the evidence for the development that Shabir alleges. Um, so what about um, some, some of the other points that, that should be erased? So he says that um, it's anachronistic to read uh, these, uh, these philosophical categories um, into the text because they didn't develop until the Council of Nicaea um, and or the Council of Constantinople, etc., where there is this explicit um, categorical distinction between um, the divine essence and, and divine persons. And it's, it's certainly true that you don't see those philosophical categories played, um, referenced in, in the Bible. But we do see the concept. The concept is there. And it doesn't matter exactly what terms you use. The, the formulation of the Trinity is understood by the Nicene Council is, is something which one is forced to as one reads the text. We see that whatever you want to call it, you can call it persons or you can call it individuals or you can call it distinctive identities. It doesn't matter what you call it, but nonetheless, there are, there are three di divine persons that are spoken of in both the Old and New Testaments who are ascribed the divine properties, attributes, and, and yet they are distinguished by virtue of um, certain uh, characteristics and features that distinguish the Father from the Son and the Son from the Holy Spirit. So um, what about reason, though? Um, and, um, actually, I think I'm out of time, so I'll close there. Thank you, Dr. McClatchy. All right, uh, Dr. Ali, you have 12 minutes for your first rebuttal. Oh, 
Sorry, Dr. Lee, you're muted again. <laughs> so here we go. All right. So I'll make uh, an att another attempt to use my own stopwatch, but uh, do feel free to remind me. Give me a reminder at six minutes and then we'll know, okay? And we'll go from there as usual. You, you did excellent last time. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so um, folks, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that uh, Jonathan is engaged with the points that I made in such uh, a reasonable and academic style, um, non-confrontational non uh, with kindness. And uh, I, I, I would try to return that uh, um, uh, graciousness as well. Okay, so Jonathan, thank you for those responses. As for the uh, idea of text, um, uh, we noticed that uh, Jonathan said that, uh, you know, the idea of the Logos is there throughout John's Gospel, but my point was specifically uh, that uh, the, the term Logos is not used in the rest of John's Gospel in this technical term sense uh, as, uh, as a reference to Jesus as the Logos of God. It, the Logos is then used in the rest of John's Gospel in the ordinary sense that, you know, somebody speaks a word. So that is anybody speaking any word that is called a Logos, but uh, we don't have a reference back to this term. Uh, and in verse 14, yes, uh, it mentions Logos uh, again, but that's only in the prologue, and that's, that's what I meant. I meant that in the prologue to John's gospel, in prologue from verses 1 uh, to 18 of John chapter 1, we have this idea of the Logos, but it's not there in the rest of John's gospel. So what is this? Some scholars think that this was tacked on uh, to John's gospel at a late stage of editing. This is specifically noted in the introduction uh, to John's gospel in the New American uh, Bible. And so it's not a sustainable idea. Of course, in the rest of John's gospel, there are ideas which uh, portray Jesus as being greater than Muslims can conceive of him to be, uh, but lesser than Trinitarians conceive of him to be. So John's gospel is not affording to Jesus uh, the, the, the belief that Jesus is the God, uh, but rather that he is a sort of begotten God, which is what his prologue really ended up saying, that uh, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father uh, has revealed him, John chapter 1, verse number 18. So Jesus is a lesser God, a, be a begotten God in John's gospel, and that's why uh, John is not saying Jesus is God. Jesus, uh, John's gospel, according to what uh, Jonathan referred to when he spoke of John chapter to 12, verse number 37, and verse number 41, and, some, and so on, is always something lesser than God. For example, the glory of the Lord, or uh, the arm of the Lord, but never the God uh, of Yahweh of the Old uh, Testament. John chapter 20, verse 28, has uh, Thomas declaring, my Lord and my God, but that could be understood within the rest of John's gospel uh, to mean that for Thomas, there is one uh, uh, that, that is the supreme God, and then there, there is Jesus, who in some lesser sense can be called God and Lord, but not in the ultimate sense. Notice that in the same chapter, 20, verse 17, uh, Jesus says, tell my brothers I'm ascending to my father and your father, my God and your God. So Jesus himself has a God, and, and that is the ultimate God. Jesus is a sort of a lesser God in John's gospel. That's why he could look up to heaven praying to God in chapter 17, verse number three, declaring, you are the only true God, and Jesus is your, is your messenger. So that's John's gospel. As for the development, it is very clear that uh, you cannot find the Logos doctrine in, in, John's, in Mark's gospel. Of course, you can find other indications that you may say, okay, this means that Jesus is God, but you're not finding the Logos doctrine in particular. So my point remains that the Logos doctrine is there only in John's gospel and only in, in the prologue, uh, in the prologue, even in, in the um, Paul's uh, writings, you have Jesus represented as the wisdom of God, which people can equate with the Logos, uh, but uh, they, you know, here you have an assumption that the Logos and the wisdom is one and the same thing. And I'm not say saying that's a bad assumption, uh, but it, it is an assumption. Uh, but the idea of the, the use of the term Logos for this only in that one place. Uh, now, in, in John, Mark chapter 1, verse number 1, uh, Jonathan, you say that it says, beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but you know that the term Son of God in that place is not in the earliest uh, manuscripts of Mark's gospel, even though elsewhere Jesus is called Son of God in Mark's gospel. We should, we should make a footnote about the, the absence of that term in John, Mark chapter 1, verse number 1, uh, obviously a later insertion into this gospel at this point. As for uh, Mark uh, combining Isaiah and 
and other Old Testament passages to say, you know, this is the one that was uh, you know, being prepared for and so on. So here we have texts adding to text. And every time you join this one with that one, and, and you, you, there's a lot of interpretation involved. What is lacking is the simple, clear, declarative statement, Jesus is Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament. That would have been very simple. You know, in the movie uh, Thor, uh, Thor is banished to earth by Odin, I believe is his father. And uh, when somebody asks him, who are you? He said, without any hesitation, I am Thor, son of Odin. So the question is, why is Jesus not able to say in Mark's gospel, or in fact, anywhere else, I am the almighty God? Uh, he might say in John's gospel, I am the son of God. Uh, but uh, then why isn't he saying that he is God if he is actually the second person of the Holy Trinity? Why doesn't he say, I am the second person of the Holy Trinity? Uh, even John's gospel, go back to John chapter 1, verse number 1. Uh, why doesn't John chapter 1, verse number 1 begin by saying, in the beginning, there were three persons who are equally God, but they all comprise only one God. One of the three persons, who we will call the second person of the Holy Trinity, came down uh, to earth, and he is what we know as Jesus. So they don't speak this language, not because the, the, the uh, philosophical categories were lacking, but because the very concept was lacking. And now, when we go Dr. to... Lee, you have just under six minutes. Okay, great. And that lines up with my timer as well. So we're doing good. Uh, so if we look at Hebrews, which is written by somebody unknown, nobody knows who wrote Hebrews. It was traditionally thought that this is written by Paul, but nowadays most scholars say that this is anonymous. So speaking about uh, the, Jesus who laid the foundation of the earth, the reason the author of Hebrews can say that is because from that author's point of view, uh, Jesus is the agent through which God created everything else. Now, if you think of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 8, uh, where wisdom is spoken about, wisdom says, I was there along with the creator. I laid down the foundation of the earth. So here is wisdom, the wisdom of God doing it. It's so, so that means that Jesus is being equated in Hebrews as in Paul and as in John's gospel, if we take wisdom equals logos, uh, that, that Jesus is being equated with the wisdom of God who laid the foundations of the earth, but not God himself. There is a distinction between God and his, uh, his wisdom that is being made in these writings. So too in Paul's writings, Paul is very clear that there is only one God and there is no God but one, and that is the Father, and Jesus is called Lord, but still, Jesus is subordinate to the Father. First uh, Corinthians chapter 11, uh, a man is, uh, is above his wife, uh, Jesus or Christ is above the man, and God is above Christ. So Christ has a subordinate position, and that will remain to eternity, because in the end, uh, in First Corinthians 15, 28, Paul says that everything will be handed back to the Father so that God will be all in all. Uh, so so for Paul, Jesus has a subordinate position, and, and that's, uh, that, that's it. Uh, Paul can say that Jesus uh, um, is the creator of the heavens and the earth, yes, because he's the agent through which God creates everything, but not the ultimate, he's not the ultimate God. As for history, Yes, it is true that the Council of Nicaea was called to combat Arius, but its declaration says more than what Arius was, uh, was disputing. For example, it begins by declaring that there is only one God, the Lord, the Almighty. Uh, so it, it could have declared that the Holy Spirit is uh, the Almighty God as well to be worshipped along with the Father and the Son. Uh, it would have been a very important core statement about Christian belief, but it's not there because that core statement took a little bit uh, uh, longer uh, to be formulated and uh, announced. Uh, so looking at the church fathers, I'll take Justin Martyr as an example for the lack of time. Now, Justin Martyr believed that uh, Jesus uh, is Jehovah, uh, Yahweh Sabaoth, as he called him, the Yahweh, the Lord of hosts. But for, ya for Justin Martyr, uh, uh, Yahweh has a father. Uh, the, the ultimate, the supreme being who never came down to earth. So Jesus was that Jehovah who was there walking in the garden in the book of Genesis. But Jehovah has a father. Um, picking up on this, uh, uh, Margaret, Barker in, Margaret Barker in her book, uh, uh, the, um, uh, Israel's Second God, uh, the great angel, Israel's Second God, uh, said that there was an ancient belief that uh, uh, precisely um, 
uh, El Elyon was the ultimate God, and El Elyon had a son whose name is Jehovah, and uh, the New Testament writers, according to her, when representing Jesus as Jehovah in some texts, as, uh, as Jonathan is happy to point out, uh, they have the idea that Jesus is Jehovah of the Old Testament, but uh, Jehovah himself has a father. Uh, so this corresponds in a way similar to what uh, uh, the, uh, Mormons uh, believe, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, in, in fact, it is a belief that most Trinitarians uh, do not hold. But Justin Martyr had uh, a belief that is akin to that, uh, equating Jesus with uh, Jehovah, but thinking that Jesus equals Jehovah has a father who is the supreme being who never came down uh, on, onto earth and whom nobody has uh, ever seen. Uh, so in, in the end, we must ask, how does Jonathan know? How do you know, my friend, that there are only three divine uh, persons? Now we come to the reasonable um, uh, realm in this. If you say that, uh, you know, when Jesus came, everybody recognized him. Now they realize that there is a third person in the Holy Trinity. Eventually it's worked out. They know that there are only three persons. Well, how do they know that there were only three persons? What if there is a fourth? What about the seven spirits in the book of Revelation? How do you know how many spirits are divine persons? How do you know that the arm of the Lord and the wisdom of the Lord and the glory of the Lord and the logos of the God are all the same individual? What if all of these are all divine persons um, that, that we should recognize from the Old Testament, from all of the passages that you quoted when you're looking at Zechariah or Isaiah and so on? Notice the way in which you have to piece together texts in order to reach that conclusion. It involves a lot of interpretation. Uh, to be, to, uh, by the time you say that this text is uh, to be connected with that text, how do you know that that's the text? What, what if it's to be connected to a third or a fourth or a different text? So it involves a lot of interpretation just to connect them together, and then further interpretation to tell us that, well, this is what each text means, and this is how they relate to each other. So uh, leaving aside all of these interpretations, we have simple, clear declarative statements. In Isaiah chapter 43, chapter 44, chapter 46, again and again, there is only one God whose name is Yahweh. And in the Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 35, and again in verse number 39, Yahweh is the only God. Besides him, there is no other. And in the New Testament, Jesus is represented as the servant thought, of Yahweh. Really. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we have another round of rebuttals coming up. These rebuttals will be each be six minutes long. And uh, Dr. McClatchy, I'll... I'll turn the floor back over to you. Well, thank you so much, Shabir, again, for an engaging uh, rebuttal. Um, let me um, address, first of all, your point that uh, you said that Jesus got, uh, John's gospel is not affording to Jesus the belief that he is the God. And you mentioned that John 12 speaks of something lesser than God, not the author of the Old Testament. In particular, you mentioned that, uh, that, he, that the glory of Yahweh in his I-6 is not the same thing as Yahweh. But Notice that it says in John chapter 12 that he saw Jesus' glory. He, he says he saw his glory in the antecedent of his as Jesus. He saw Jesus' glory and wrote of him. Um, and so when you look back at Isaiah 6, which it just got done quoting, you see that, um, and you look at the Greek Septuagint translation, which John is alluding to, and it says in verse 1, um, and the whole temple was filled with, with the glory of the Lord. And so he saw not just the glory, but he saw the glory specifically of the Lord. And John says he saw Jesus' glory in John chapter 12. And so there's no escaping that John identifies uh, um, Jesus as the Yahweh of the Old Testament. I can give another example in, from John's gospel. If we look at John chapter 10, we read um, from ver the verses leading up to verse 30. Um, so, um, my, so Jesus says in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now notice that in the verses leading up to this, he says, I give them eternal, he says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. That's an allusion to Psalm 95. Um, in Psalm 95, we see, um, it says, uh, o come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah. So Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. Um, they know me and they follow me. 
And he continues, I give them eternal life. Who could say that except for God himself? And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. That's also an allusion to the Old Testament. If you look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 39, it says, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. And so Jesus quotes from or alludes to Psalm 95, and then just passage in Deuteronomy 32, 39. And then in that context, it, he says, um, so my father who's who's given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. So he's one, not just in terms of function or role, but he's one, uh, not just simply unity of purpose, but one in, in essence, one ontologically. Um, and we see that by virtue of his quotation of those Old Testament passages. There's plenty other examples that we can look at. Um, he uh, mentioned uh, in John 20, verse 28, it could be understood to mean that uh, for Thomas, there is one who is the supreme God and that Jesus, in some sense, um, can be called God and Lord. Well, how much more explicit do you need it to be? You complain when um, when it, the New Testament authors, uh, in your view, don't come out clearly and say that Jesus is God. Or, um, But then you have Jesus in John chapter um, 20, who is called my uh, the Lord of me and the God of me, even uses the article in John 20, verse 28. And Jesus doesn't rebuke Thomas. Uh, he doesn't as do what the angel does in the book of Revelation and say to John, don't do that when he tries to worship the angel, just worship God. No, he receives this recognition of his identity from Thomas. You also see the recognition of Jesus' identity from the other disciples. So for example, in Luke 24, when you have the ascension at the end of uh, Luke chapter 24, we read that he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted them and was carried up to, into heaven and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem. Um, it's it's um, proskinesantis, it's a participle that's derived from proskineo, meaning uh, to worship, which is, uh, uh, which is in a religious context, although it, 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 um, in, in a religious context, it always means to worship um, as, as to a God. And the religious context is clear because Jesus has already ascended. So there again, we see not just Thomas recognizes the divine identity of Jesus, but also so do the disciples, the other disciples. Um, he mentioned that um, um, in Mark chapter one, the son of the title son of God is not in the earliest manuscripts. And this, of course, is, is true, but it's not relevant to um, the utilization of Malachi three, verse one and Isaiah 40, verse three. Um, he mentioned um, that um, Jesus has a God over him. He, he, he says in um, John 20, verse 17, do not cling to me for I have not yet sent to the, to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am sending to my father and your father, to my God and to your God. So if Jesus has a God over him, um, according to Shabir, how, how can we say that Jesus himself is God? Um, and of course, when one is interpreting a verse, one has to be careful to first interpret it in view of the immediate context and then the context of the whole book and then in the context of books by the same author and then finally in the context of the whole Bible. And in particular, if your interpretation of a verse contradicts the uniform message of the whole book, you have probably misinterpreted the verse. And the proximity of this verse to verse 28 of the same chapter where Thomas calls Jesus the Lord of me and the God of me should start the alarm bells ring. And, um, and then there are numerous affirmations of the deity of Christ throughout the Gospel of John as a whole. Um, but nonetheless, should be a raises a legitimate point, um, which needs to be addressed. And in Jeremiah 32, 27, we read, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? So John 1, so that's Yahweh speaking. Now John 1, 14 tells us that the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So if the word, that is the Christ, uh, became flesh and the Father is the God of all flesh, then what, what would that make the Father in relation to Christ? It would make him his God. Um, and uh, indeed, um, you, you see, in, in, even in Revelation 22, 6, even in Revelation, it mentions um, Jesus identifies the Father as his God, and yet very, there are very clear statements in the book of Revelation where Jesus also identifies himself as um, God. Um, for example, he even quotes um, the Old Testament, like in Revelation 1, for example, where it says um, that uh, he is coming on clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierce them, which is referring back to... Dr. Dr. McClatchy, if you could finish up your thought. Thank you. That's um, all for this rebuttal. All right. Thank you, Dr. McClatchy. And uh, for our final rebuttal of the, the debate round, uh, Dr. Ali, you'll have six minutes for your second rebuttal. Uh, sorry, you're muted again. <laughs> Uh, 
You're still muted, Shabir. How about now? Okay. There we go. That's better. All right. Thanks again, Jonathan. And uh, now for this uh, second um, uh, response to, to Jonathan, let me say that again, Jonathan has to tie text with text. Uh, so we see Jesus's glory. And in Isaiah 6, there is the glory of Yahweh. So you must equate the two. But it doesn't mean that the two are to be equated. It could be that like father, like son, they're saying that just as Yahweh has a glory, Jesus has a glory, we are seeing the glory, maybe in some way the glory is shared. There, there is a shared glory between the two of them. Uh, maybe Jesus in a way is the reflection of the glory of Yahweh in the minds of these writers. But in, it, it, you don't have a simple, clear declarative statement from these writers, Jesus is uh, Yahweh. You have to put pieces together as if you're reading the Bible like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, whereas there are simple, clear, declarative statements where Jesus says, they are, uh, the only true God, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus, your messenger as Christ. Where Paul says, there is only one God. There is no God but one. And, and the one God is the Father. So this is very simple, clear, declarative. Now, what about John 20, verse 28, where uh, Jesus um, is said by Thomas to be uh, my Lord and my, my God. Well, it's not a simple declarative statement. It is a statement of exclamation. And, uh, you know, this has been discussed by Christians uh, who said that uh, maybe Thomas was just ex uh, excited and, uh, you know, to see Jesus again. And just as we might say, my God, uh, to somebody who is not God, just because we're excited to see them, uh, that could be the reason. But even if we don't take that, uh, what is the message of Jesus in John's gospel itself? In the very chapter, tell my brothers, I'm sending to my father and your father, my God and your God. So the message would have already reached Thomas that uh, Jesus has a God. And uh, if even if Thomas considers uh, in John's gospel that, uh, that Jesus is his God, uh, but, but that's only a secondary God. It is a begotten God. And that's how G John's gospel is presenting Jesus as a secondary, as a begotten God, uh, especially in John chapter one, verse number 18. And it's the same gospel in which Jesus says, I live because of the father. In John chapter 14, verse 28, the father is greater than I. So Jesus is establishing that there is one greater than himself. He's not the ultimate God, even if you call him a God in John's gospel. But notice that this is the development. You can't get this from from Mark's gospel, the earliest of the four. Rather, you see this development from Mark to, to John, where Jesus is systematically being represented as bigger, greater, uh, more knowledgeable, uh, more defined than you can find him in uh, Mark's uh, gospel. And then you can see that there are changes in the text. Mark chapter one, verse number one doesn't say son of God, but uh, you know, it's been inserted and some people like to keep it uh, there. But we should be honest about what the text should contain and should not uh, contain. So again, hearing the voice of God in John chapter 10, why don't we, not, why don't we see that John chapter 10, verse uh, uh, number 30 uh, says that after the Jews picked up stones to stone him, Jesus said uh, that in, in the Psalms, 82, the, the judges are called God. So why are you blaming me? Because I said, I am the son of God. Uh, the argument only works if uh, Jesus meant son of God in the metaphorical sense. He's saying, you know, the, the, the terms are used metaphorically so that even the judges can be called gods. Uh, so why are you blaming me? Because I said, I'm the son of God. That means I'm using the term son of God in the metaphorical sense. Why didn't you get it? Uh, and Luke 24 says that, that they worship him, but to verse number 52, where this is said, is a disputed text. It's not found in some of the ancient manuscripts. But even if we take this as, uh, as a valid text, proskuneo, uh, that does not necessarily mean that they worshiped him. It could mean that they bowed before him, just as Young's literal translation of the Bible uh, rends, renders this uh, verse. And we see elsewhere in the Bible that people proskuno uh, in, in front of others. It doesn't mean that they worship them or take them to be God. First Corinthians chapter uh, 20, verse 29 has people worshiping the uh, uh, God and the king. Uh, so the king at the time was a human being, not God, but people can do that. Uh, now, if, 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 Joshua, uh, sorry, uh, Jonathan says uh, that uh, when we read in John chapter one, verse 14, uh, that uh, God, God, that uh, Jesus became flesh. Well, tie that to the idea in Jeremiah that God is the God of all flesh. That means automatically that God is the God of Jesus, but only the fleshly uh, part. Uh, but uh, that I is a far stretch. You have about a minute and a half remaining. 
Uh, thank you. So that is a, a far stretch. Uh, I think it is very clear that uh, Jesus has a God, even in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 3, you will find that uh, again and again, it is said that Jesus has a God. So Jesus is represented in the Johannian writings as a lesser God, but above him, clearly, that means that implies that there is a God who is the ultimate, who is the only true God. In a previous uh, 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 presentation, uh, Jonathan spoke about the Son of Man of Daniel 7. Uh, but notice that uh, that is explained in Daniel 7 itself uh, to be the people of Israel. And uh, so the people of Israel, they're not being worshipped as God. They're, they're being showed a basins to or they're given the respect that is due uh, to the people of God. Uh, but Daniel 7 explains itself. There is no uh, um, uh, physical or real uh, second God there. It's, it's only a representation of the people of God. But even if you take that to be a, a, a distinct person, it's a lesser person than the Ancient of Days, who obviously is the only uh, true God. I rest my case, and I thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Ali. We'll now have a time of question and answer from you all. So we'll we have a couple of venues for fielding your questions. The I've opened the chat so that you can send chats directly to me, the host, in, if you're in the Zoom room. And we'll also be fielding questions from the YouTube live stream chat. So if you're, if you're in the YouTube live stream, you can send your questions via chat. But also, if you're in the Zoom room, we do have the option for you to raise your hand. If you go to the participants window uh, on the bottom control panel and find the blue raise hand function, you can raise your hand and I will ask you to unmute yourself and you can ask your question verbally. So those are the three, three options you have for asking questions. And I've, I've already gotten a couple of questions in the chat. So I'll ask one question from the chat before I, before I start un, unmuting people and letting them ask their question. This question comes from Elias, I believe, from Scotland. She first says, or this person, I guess I don't know the gender. <laughs> she, uh, the first say, thank you to both speakers for this scholarly and informative discussion. My question is to Dr. McClatchy. And the question is, where do you draw the line from the Bible that there are only three persons in the Christian Godhead and no more? If there is no such verse limiting to three and merely mentioning three things without actually specifying that these are the only three, uh, why do we have to stop at three beings in one? Okay. So I think this was touched on, but if you want to respond to it directly, that'd be awesome. Sure, excellent question. Thanks uh, for submitting that. Um, so I, I think that would be more of a potent objection if I was arguing, and some theologians do, um, that uh, there's a progressive revelation of the Trinity is not something that you find in the Old Testament, but it's it, there's a progressive revelation and it's revealed as a new doctrine in the New Testament. And then Shabir raised the objection, for, for instance, in his debate with Nabil Qureshi, um, as to, uh, well, how do you know that there's not some other further divine person waiting in the shadows, um, ready to reveal himself at some future point? Um, and I, I would actually argue that God has always revealed himself as three persons. I, I believe that throughout the Old and New Testament, you see um, that God reveals himself as the Father, his messenger, and the Holy Spirit, and actually identifies the messenger as the Messiah. And I think um, one can make a robust argument for the identity of the angel of the Lord or the Melech Yahweh as the, the Messiah, I give the, um, the example from Malachi 3 verse 1 um, and its uh, connection with uh, Judges 2 verse 1. I think there's other ways of making that argument as well. Even the New Testament, I would argue, uh, represents Jesus as being, uh, the, as, as being the messenger of the Lord. For example, in uh, Jude chapter 1, we read um, um, about at, in verse uh, 5, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So actually, um, what is attributed in the Old Testament to the angel of the Lord is, is here attributed to Jesus himself. Now, some, some Unitarians like to argue, well, verse 4, uh, what was, uh, some Unitarians like to argue that, the, um, that, in, in, that in some manuscripts, it actually doesn't say Jesus, it says the Lord who saved the people out of the land of Egypt. But even if you go with that reading, uh, which I, I personally think that the more likely reading is Jesus, but let's just take the other reading for the sake of argument. In the previous verse, it actually um, identifies Jesus as our only master and Lord. And so even if you go with that, Jesus still ends up being the one who saves uh, people out of the land of Egypt. Um, so that would be in terms of the Bible. In terms of uh, philosophy, 
I would argue that um, that a plurality of divine persons, the uh, plurality of divine persons is um, is uh, called for by the fact that um, if God has, is essentially loving in his very nature, then he has to have someone to express that love towards uh, before uh, the creation of the world. Um, and adding a third divine person actually introduces a new quality of goodness, um, namely the cooperation and sharing that good with another. This is an argument developed by Richard Swinburne. But introducing a fourth divine person and so forth introduces no fundamental new quality of goodness. And so three is the, the best number for maximizing divine goodness um, uh, without, um, without being redundant. So um, that would be a biblical argument and philosophical argument for taking three um, divine persons. Thank you, Dr. McClatchy. Um, we have a couple of uh, questions, uh, people hoping to ask questions in the Zoom room. So, uh, Finney Caravilla, I've asked you to unmute yourself and you can ask, unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, thanks for the, the very interesting debate. Appreciate it. Yeah, one of the most intriguing lines from the whole session, I thought, came from Dr. Ali, who said that the conception of, of um, Jesus in John was higher than Muslims could agree to, but lower than at least the typical Trinitarian representation. And I, I would actually tend to agree with that. There is there's a one of the one of the misrepresented versions of the Trinity is almost as if they're three brothers and sort of equivalent parties. As it turns out, the the earliest understanding of the Trinity, particularly pre-Nicaea, is often called the subordination view, where the Father is the the source, and Irenaeus famously uses this analogy of the, the Spirit and the Son as the two arms of the Father, and it it actually fits very well with what you described. Where whereas today I feel like the Trinity is often portrayed as three roughly equivalent beings, and in this view, this this earlier view that you have, particularly pre-Nicaea, you have a I think a view that nicely explains exactly what you described in your in your uh, line there, but but my my question is is more along the lines of, I mean there's there's many statements as you would I'm sure agree in the New Testament that Muslims would not agree with. I mean the the one that comes to my mind is in Matthew 28 where Jesus says, "All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me." Uh, and that's a very strong statement where Jesus says and claims that he has all authority in heaven on earth. And no, I don't believe any Muslim would agree with that. And so, so my, my question is, is given, given those statements, those very high statements that Muslims would not ag agree with, what is, the, what is the value of even engaging with the biblical text in the sense that it would seem like if there's a view that contradicts standard Islamic view, the verse would be, started or said to be a corruption or something like that and and then but if it agrees well hey look it agrees with us but in the end it's it's simply it seems like it's just a self-referential system that is only going to appeal to dr, dr. Carvilla, if you could if you could uh go ahead and ask your question yeah Sorry, so that was the question that was the question in. so it's like is that it's that sort of that the notion of when there's verses that agree well then it's great see the, the quran is true and if it doesn't well it's, it's got to be some corruption there. But I did want to put that opening preface there because I do think that was a very insightful statement that deserves amplification. Yeah, so um, Dr. Carvella, I'm so uh, thankful for your uh, generous uh, response to what I said. And uh, yes, I think uh, it, it's worth uh, underscoring that, uh, that there has been developments uh, among the um, early uh, uh, Christian leaders and, and church fathers um, with regards to how exactly to represent uh, the, the Trinity. And, and we can distinguish also between an economic Trinity and an ontological Trinity. And, and if we read books on the development, we can see, for example, Robert Grant's book, uh, The Early Christian Doctrine of God. Um, we, we can see that there has been a development over time uh, so that Robert Grant feels constrained to use the word triad uh, for, for those uh, references which speak about the three but do not make any attempt uh, to show that they are a unity. And then if uh, th there is also the um, distinction between a Binitarianism and a Trinitarianism. So we move from a Binitarianism at one point to eventually a Trinitarianism and so on. But uh, coming to your uh, question about Matthew 28, uh, where Jesus says, all authority has been given uh, to me. Well, notice that it, it, the authority is given to him. 
It is not something that is intrinsic to him. And that same authority, according to Paul's uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28, will eventually be handed back to the Father so that God will be all in all. So in Paul's mind, there is one who is called God, and there is Jesus. Jesus has the authority for a limited time. It will be handed back to the Father. The Father will be overwhelming uh, in, in the end. Thank you, Dr. Ali. And I'm gonna take another question from chat before I, before I let um, someone speak here again. So the question is from Joshua Stolzfus. What does the Islamic tradition think of the Hebrew Bible and do Muslims consider it scripture or divinely inspired? Hmm. So uh, this also ties in with uh, Dr. Karvula's uh, um, question, and I'm so sorry that I neglected to answer that, that part of his question, but now here it comes. So uh, with regard to the Bible on the whole, uh, the, the Quran speaks very respectfully about uh, the Torah, the Psalms, and the Gospel uh, specifically, and uh, also uh, in a more general way to the revelations given to previous prophets from God. Many of the prophets of the Hebrew Bible are named in the Quran. Some 18 of them are, are maybe, uh, yeah, some 18 of them from the Bible are, are named in, in the Quran, or at least 18, I can say. And uh, so Muslims have come to respect the sacred scriptures, and there have been various attitudes among Muslims throughout history as to how to regard the uh, sacred scriptures of, of Jews and Christians, to the extent that some uh, Christians, some Muslim scholars thought that just as Muslims would want to uh, go through a kind of ritual purification before they hold the Quranic text, that uh, we should also do the same before we hold the biblical text because we consider it to have the sacred revelation from God. At the same time, the more and more Muslims got to be familiar with the contents of the Bible, they reflected on verses of the Quran, which indicate that people in the past changed things in the revelation from God. For example, in Surah 2, verse number 75, which some say refer specifically to the Jewish uh, scriptures, where it says, uh, do you uh, hope that they will believe in you, whereas uh, a party among them uh, used to hear the revelation from God and then change it deliberately after knowing what, it, what, it, what the truth is. Uh, so uh, Muslims then have uh, tended to see that there are changes uh, in the way in which the uh, sacred scriptures from the past have been transmitted uh, throughout the generations. And of course, uh, they, uh, they, they, they uh, pick up on the studies of Christian and Jewish scholars who reach a similar conclusion, not from within the context of the Quranic worldview, uh, but uh, from their own independent studies of the transmission and development uh, of the uh, writings over history. Thank you, Dr. Ali. And now we have uh, someone in the Zoom room, Munib Zia. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself and you can go ahead and ask your question now. Yes, hi, thank you for uh, to both speakers for this uh, great talk and discussion. Uh, my question is for Dr. McClatchy, um, actually two questions. And from the framework that Dr. Ali has laid forward, so one is on the text and one is reason. So for text, you mentioned, uh, you actually put an emphasis on Latruo as being religious service. Uh, but in Deuteronomy 28, 48, like Latruo is given to Israel as well, right? So God says to Israel, to Latruo, your enemies, essentially, not, not her. Latrua, your enemies. So that's, you know, in De Deuteronomy 28, 48. So that's my first part. So th clearly there is, is an instance where Latrua is used otherwise. And then for the reason, um, you know, my question was that Trinitarian stress that you're not supposed to split nature. So when we talk about Jesus Christ, he is both God and man. So you're not supposed to think that half man or half God. So the whole person of Christ is both at the same time. But then while worshiping Jesus, you almost have to worship the human nature as well. There's no way around it, right? So can you, can you comment on that, that, you know, once when, when Christians worship Jesus, how can you not worship the human nature? Because I think even Christians would agree for a flesh that could die, it does not deserve worship, right? So those are the two points. Sorry, sorry. Could you clarify the second part of the question? I wasn't quite sure what you were getting at there. So Jesus has divine and human nature. The person of Christ has divine nature and human nature. Yeah. So when you worship Jesus, you have to worship his human nature alongside because you're not supposed to split human nature and God nature. Because you, Jesus is one person with both. So when you're worshiping Jesus, don't you have to worship the human nature as well? And isn't that blasphemy even according to Christians? 
Uh, no, we don't, we don't worship a nature. We don't worship natures. We worship a person. Yeah. yeah, that's my point. Like when you're worshiping Christ, the person of Christ, which has both natures, so you're worshiping both human and divine nature. Uh, well, we're not. We're worshiping a person. We're not worshiping his nature, right? So, but that person has both natures. Right. So you are, are you agreeing that I think you know the person would have both natures, right? Yeah, but I think we'll, we'll let Dr. McClatchy answer, answer yeah. the question and then we'll move on. Thank you Sorry. for the question. Yeah, so we, we worship a person. We don't worship a nature. We don't worship nature. We worship uh, Father, we worship the Son, and worship the Holy Spirit. The Son happens to have two natures. So we worship the whole person of, of the Son. As to uh, Deuteronomy 28, 48, I'm trying to check the Septuagint here to see what the actual word is used there. Um, but let's suppose, uh, let me check this real quickly. Um, Okay. Um, okay, so it does use um, in the third person. So it says Le Trevis, um, or you second person rather. Um, so um, yes, you're absolutely correct. It uses the word Le, Tre Le Trevo there. Um, but in, in Daniel, um, there's eight other times in which that word is used and it always denotes ser uh, religious service to the one true God or the gods. And in um, and I'm not aware of any other example in the in the Old Testament of Jewish, and please correct me if I'm wrong, where that word is used. And so um, I would argue that it nonetheless is is more is more is, is more is better predicted on the hypothesis of, of Jesus' deity than on the falsehood. And that wasn't the only argument that I presented in regards to um, in regards to um, the, the deity of the Son of Man. I also pointed out the relationship to Daniel 6, 26 in the previous chapter with the words of Darius. I could also bring up the fact that in Daniel 7, the Son of Man figure is said to ride the clouds, uh, which is something which is said in various Old Testament passages um, of Yahweh, such as in Psalm 104, 3, uh, Psalm 19, verse 1, and so forth, various other texts. Um, I, I also wanted to comment um, on one thing Jabir said um, during his rebuttal, where he said, that the son of man figure in Daniel 7 is the nation of Israel. I, I disagree with that. Um, in, the nation, in Daniel 7, we see uh, four great beasts who are representative of, who are representing the nations. But if you look carefully at the text, you learn that the, each of these beasts is represented by uh, a king um, who represents those nations. And I would argue that the son of man is representing the nation of Israel. And you see this, um, this sort of role elsewhere in the Old Testament associated with the Messiah, where he's a priest. For example, on Psalm 110, he's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You see that in Isaiah 53. Dr. McClatchy, I think we should probably reserve uh, this time for answering questions directly, sure. and then uh, you'll have an opportunity to respond to Dr. Lee's sure. arguments later. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, though. Um, okay, so we've got another, I'm gonna, gonna flip flop between chat and live questions here. So we have, we have another question from chat. Jonathan, why do you think that the new, this is for Dr. McClatchy. Why do you think that the New Testament does not directly say that Jesus is God, like Shabir suggests would be expected? Do you have a, just a short nutshell response, I guess, for, for that claim that Shabir makes? Well, I think it does. I and mean, if we look at um, John 1, I think that's, that's a very direct claim. It's, all, it's pretty much as emphatic as you could uh, expect John to do. Um, in John 1, 1, he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Um, I mean, how more explicit do you want it to be? It's sort of uh, Hebrews um, in chapter number one, we read, um, um, uh, he is uh, speaking of Christ. Um, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Um, you see in, in Colossians chapter one, um, verse uh, 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the first one from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether in heaven or on earth, being peace with the blood of the cross. One final example is in Titus 2.13 where a um, very famous um, example of a Grenville Sharp construction in Greek, uh, which the Greek students amongst us will be familiar with, as, uh, which actually demonstrates the deity of Christ in this verse, waiting for our, where, it says, waiting, where Paul says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, so how much more explicit do you want it to be? Thank you, Dr. McClatchy. And uh, Kenny Bomer has a question. And I'll just ask you to 
unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Okay, thank you very much for taking my question. I very much enjoyed listening to this debate uh, from these two respected gentlemen. Uh, so my, my question is actually in regards to John 1.1, 1, 1, in regards to the word logos. Um, if we look at Lane's lexicon and Strong's concordance, it, it's defined as a word uttered by a living voice that embodies a concept or an idea, what someone said, the sayings of God and so forth. And it mentions in a footnote at the bottom there that uh, the Greek philosopher named Heracleitus, Heracleitus rather, first used the term logos around 600 BC to designate the divine reason or plan which coordinates a changing universe. And so every, every uh, bit of definition that they give for the word logos is defining it as a speech of our creator. Um, so how is it that you, had, how is it that you uh, equate that to Jesus when the very definition of the word does not say Jesus? Anytime it's referred to that in their explanation, it places Jesus, the name Jesus, peace be upon him, in parentheses. But again, the word, by definition, does not mean he, she, it. It actually means a literal speech or um, sure. the, words, the words of the creator. So, so um, if you want the longer answer to this, I recommend a book by um, a guy called South African scholar called John Ronin called uh, The Jewish Targums and John Vlada Theology, uh, where he actually um, shows, um, that, uh, shows just how saturated John's gospel is um, with that logos um, theme that's, that's being drawn from the Aramaic Targumim, because the Aramaic Targumim, which are Aramaic paraphrases of the Old Testament, um, uh, basically identify um, the, the Memra as, uh, or the word of the Lord as, as being, it, it, they equate that with, with the angel of the Lord, which I alluded to in my opening statement. So um, that, um, yes, that, that word logos um, in Greek um, is used by various other authors. It's used by, by Philo, who is a Jewish philosopher, is used in, in Greek philosophy, but when um, but when it's used in the context of John one, we have to look at what's the Jewish background of that word, and I would argue that it traces its origins back to the Aramaic targum, um, and uh, and it's it's the Greek equivalent of the memoir of the Lord, and Christ is being represented as that memoir of the Lord, which in the context of the targum, many quotes I could share with you, it identifies the, that that memoir of the Lord, that word of the Lord, as the angel of the Lord, and furthermore in ver in verse one. It, it doesn't just mention, uh, it, it's not just a, an isolated word where it calls them the word. It says, in the beginning was the word. In other words, as far back as you want to push that beginning, the word already was in existence. That's the most literal way of interpreting and translating that. And the word was with God and the word was God. Um, so there's no um, escape. I mean, you can disagree with what John's saying here, but you can't say that John's not representing Jesus as God in the full sense of the word. Thank you, Dr. McClatchy. Um, just a, a, I guess a quick question to the debaters. If, would you be willing to extend the, the, Q &A, the Q and A time for another five or 10 minutes? We have a sure. huge number of questions that aren't, we aren't gonna be able to get to even in that time. But uh, if, sure. you're, if you're willing sure. to do that, then we would extend it. Sure, yeah, Dr. Lee, fine with me, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna make sure that I, don't go too far over here. <laughs> and I'll take another question from chat here. Oh, excuse me. I'll take another question from chat here uh, before uh, getting to uh, World Wava's question. So this, is, this question is from Lois Friesen. Thanks to both speakers for the great engagement. I appreciate this greatly. And this question is for Dr. Ali. Why is the hermeneutic method of seeking answers by comparing and finding continuity between scriptures problematic for interpretations. And I think she's referring to the to what Dr. McClatchy was doing that you critiqued of, of maybe being a bit uh, open to different different options and not straightforward. Is this a particular reflection of a different hermeneutic for Muslims? Uh, no, in fact, uh, I I agree with uh, with uh, Dr. McClatchy that uh, you know we must interpret uh, the writings of a particular writer uh, within the context of his own. Uh, first of all, the, the same chapter, the same book, uh, the writings of the same person. Uh, the, if we're dealing with the New Testament text, the writings of the New Testament as a whole. Uh, and then, because the New Testament is part of the, of the Bible, we interpret that in the light of the Bible as a whole, and so on. Yes, I agree with that step. But uh, what I think uh, we, we should insist upon is that uh, we cannot uh, leave aside the simple, clear, declarative statements of a writer and then try to piece together other texts to make the, the writer say something different than what was there in the simple, clear, declarative text. 
So in the Bible, it is very clear there is only one God whose name is Yahweh, who says, I am Yahweh, I am the only God before me, no God was formed, nor there shall, shall be one after me, and so on. The statements like this, simple, clear, declarative, leaving no questions aside. You don't have to ask any grammarian. Uh, you don't have to uh, go to another text to see how this joins with another one. Simple, clear, declarative. Uh, so now we, we cannot take a text from John or Paul or anyone else to say, well, okay, when we join this with the Old Testament text, we go to Isaiah 48, then we go to Isaiah 63, then we go to Psalm 52. And, and then so we join all of these together and we get this mishmash of ideas, which result in the uh, opposite of this simple, clear declaration from the Bible. And if this was a simple, de clear declaration from the book of Isaiah, we can find simple statements in John's gospel, in uh, the writings of Paul, and the writings of other New Testament writers, indicating that there is only one God, the one to whom Jesus prayed, in the lips of Jesus, him, uh, from the lips of Jesus himself, and from the actions of Jesus. Jesus fell on his face and prayed. Who was he praying to? He obviously has a God, and so on. So uh, all of this is simple, clear, and, and it does not need uh, any elaboration, and doesn't need somebody with a PhD to tell you uh, what the text is saying. Thank you, Dr. Ali. And now, uh, World Dawa, if you, if you would like, I will ask you to unmute yourself, and you can ask your question. Hello to everybody. How is everyone? Uh, I've got a question for uh, Jonathan. Um, where the Jesus soul was created before he become a human? So let me clarify about your question, correct? You asked where was Jesus soul created before he became a human? Is that correct? Yeah. And actually, a couple of parts, so I need to go step by step to okay. understand. The simple answer to that is I don't know, and I don't think it's important. Okay, so when, <clears throat> when actually he came to existence, then according to Bible, to Christianity, he crucified, correct? Jesus was crucified, correct. Good. Where does his soul gone to? Uh, well, he told, he told the... Rock, the um, the, uh, the criminal that was on the cross advised Jesus that uh, this day I will see you and you will see me in paradise. Um, so he went to paradise. So for three days and three nights, yeah? Correct. World of, I think I think we'll try to restrict it to one question so that so that people have a, other people have a chance to ask Good. as well. Uh, can I just make a second part of the equations? Um, if you, have, if you have one more question, you can ask it, but yeah, probably not like you. a string. <laughs> but still, still, the first part, I haven't got the answer. That's not what the Bible said. I, I answered what the Bible says. So if you have a quick question, I'm happy to address it, but if it's going to be like a long dialogue. No problem. Have... The second question is, mm -hmm. when Jesus was on the cross, according to the Bible, he was saying, oh, God, God, why are you forsaking me? Correct? Yes. Correct. What we believe in the Old Testament, God doesn't for, forsake his servant, his, uh, uh, his, his, his servant, according to uh, Psalm 37, 28, Psalm 94, 14. So, in, so let, let me address this and then we'll move on to another question here. But yeah. Jesus, um, in, the, in the Passion Narrative, is actually quoting from Psalm 22, verse 1. Um, he says, you know, which is quoting from Psalm 22, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if you look at the context, you see um, a, a passage which talks uh, you know, about 1000 BC, talks about um, a scene which seems to resemble quite strikingly a crucifixion scene. And many interpreters, both ancient and modern, not just Christian interpreters, have interpreted it as a messianic in nature, uh, that text. And, uh, and so Jesus, in quoting Psalm 22, verse 1, is... Uh, emphasizing that this is now being fulfilled um, in in sight of those who are present at Jesus' crucifixion, and of course, yes, he, Jesus was uh, forsaken by the Father in the sense that God's wrath abided on the Father because Christ died upon the cross, absorbing the penalty for our sins. So He was cut off from God's favorable presence on our behalf because we deserve to be because we were unrighteous, and Christ took our place by standing in our stead. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Dr. McClatchy. And I'll, I'll read another question from the chat now. This is, this is from the YouTube chat. It says, the Quran states that the people of the book, Christians, have no ground to stand on but their holy text. 
which is contradictory to the Quran. How is this reconciled with the Muslim faith? Yeah, so I think the, the writer, the, the, the questioner is um, referring to a verse in the Quran which says, Let the people of the gospel judge according to what God has revealed uh, in it. And another text which says that they, they stand on no ground until they observe what is there in the, um, the Torah and, and the gospel and that which has been revealed from God. So taking the last uh, part first, um, uh, which is what, the, you know, squarely with what the uh, questioner is asking, uh, from the Quranic point of view, God has revealed previous messages to previous uh, prophets and also now to the last of all of the prophets, Muhammad, on whom be peace. So from this uh, verse, we, we ascertain that uh, God is saying that uh, the, the people of the scriptures, meaning Jews and Christians in particular, but more generally people who follow uh, previous scriptural revelation, they have no ground to stand on unless they are observing their revelation from God. And they are also observing that revelation which has now come from God to the last of all of the prophets. So that uh, uh, puts the burden on people who claim to follow a previous scripture uh, to show how their scripture is in alignment with what God is now finally revealing, because all all of this has to be harmonized. And that's what Muslims try to do. They harmonize the teachings of the Bible uh, with the teachings of the Quran, knowing that the Quran is the final revelation from God, which may abrogate some of the previous teachings and also would uh, correct some of the mistakes that crept into uh, the transmission process of the previous uh, scriptures. And uh, as for the verse which says, uh, let the people of the script of the Bible, of the gospel judge by what God has revealed therein, this makes it clear that we're not talking about all of the gospel, but we're talking about what God has revealed therein. From the Quranic point of view, there is a distinction because it's possible that people inserted things into uh, the gospels and other writings, and the Quran is insisting that only that which God revealed is the final arbiter and judge uh, to decide what is true and, and false. Thank you, Dr. Ali. And uh, we'll now turn to Nazam Gufour. I hope I'm pronouncing these names right. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Uh, hi, everyone. I um, hope you don't mind me taking the liberty. Um, I don't actually have a question. I just wanted to say hi to Dr. Jonathan and um, to Dr. Shibir Ali. I haven't seen them for a few years, and I remember um, attending both of the debates in London um, when uh, Dr. Tanvir uh, was present as well, who's sadly not with us no longer. Uh, but I'm, st I'm glad that you two are still continue to have your dialogue. So uh, God bless. Thank you, Nazam. All right, another question from chat then. Hopefully we'll have time for this. Um, my question to Dr. McClatchy is, what do you think of the idea that Paul believed that Jesus was subordinate to the Father since Paul called Jesus as Lord and Father as God? Yeah. So, so building on Dr. Ali's. Yeah. So I believe there he is alluding to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Um, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, in the context of talking about idolatry, uh, Paul says, For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods, many lords, Verse 6, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Kyrios, one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and to whom we exist. Um, and many scholars believe um, that this is actually an allusion to the Greek uh, translation of the Hebrew Shema that I alluded to previously from Deuteronomy 6.4, and that he's actually identifying Jesus as the Kyrios from the Shema, the Lord of the Shema, which would actually be um, identifying Christ as God. And furthermore, notice that it says, from whom are all things and for whom we exist um, in relation to the Father. And then it repeats that in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ, or whom are all things and through whom we exist. And so the Father and Lord Jesus Christ are indeed co-creators um, in, uh, in creation. And as Shabir has rightly pointed out uh, before, um, uh, in agreement with me, the, um, we, we need to interpret uh, scripture in light of scripture. And if you look throughout 1 Corinthians, we see that Jesus is pre presented as being uh, the Lord God in various other places as well. I already alluded to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 
where um, it says to the church of God that is in Corinth, those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, echoing Joel chapter 2, um, all who call upon the name of, of the Lord or Yahweh will be saved. Um, also, 1 Corinthians 10 is absolutely saturated with imagery from Deuteronomy 32. You can go and check it out for yourself. And in that context, he identifies the rock as Christ in verse 4. And if you look back at Deuteronomy 32, you actually learn that the rock is the Lord God himself. Uh, so there's just a couple examples um, there from 1 Corinthians. Uh, but hopefully that uh, answers your question. Thank you, Dr. McClatchy. And I, I apologize to all the questions in chat and the people who, who asked great questions that we just won't have time to get to. Thank you. Thank you for putting the thought into it. And uh, maybe if you get a chance, you can, can ask uh, these questions in a different, a different venue or a different format. So... We'll now be moving on to the next component of the debate, which is a cross-examination time. So Dr. McClatchy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the first opportunity to cross-examine Dr. Ali, and you will have 10 minutes for this. Excellent, well, thank you. Um, so let's go over to the Old Testament, uh, which I, um, I am expanded upon in my opening remarks. Uh, let's start with uh, Zechariah chapter two. And um, I want to get Shabir's opinion on whether this is more consistent with my Trinitarian perspective or his uh, Islamic Tawhid perspective. Um, and so Shabir, I, I read um, Zechariah 2 in my opening remarks. Uh, what, what's your view on, on that? Can you remind me of the verses? Yeah, sure. So this is just um, talk, it's alluding to um, Israel's restoration from exile. And it, it, it's the one that says, um, uh, um, so, verse 11 in particular, I will dwell in your midst and you shall know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. So Yahweh has been sent by Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So, so you're confident that Yahweh is the speaker in this, in this whole passage yes, saying that Yahweh sent me. Correct. I'm very confident of that. Yes. Okay. So from this, you would conclude that there are two Yahwehs. I would, yes. I would, I would conclude that there are two people who bear the name of Yahweh. Yes. Which is okay. So when, when Yahweh says, I am the only God, and besides me, there is no other which Yahweh of the two is speaking? Uh, so um, in these texts, of course, we, we affirm that Yahweh is the only God, but we also affirm that there are, there are three persons who participate in and share that divine essence. And so the title of Yahweh is rightly applied to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay. So, so, so there are three who are called Yahweh then? Correct. Okay. So... Um, Okay, then it's an interesting perspective, but I have to study this passage a little bit more in detail to, to see where are the shifts in, in speakers, because we know that many of the Old Testament passages are quite poetic and there are constant shifts in, in, in references and, and speakers. I don't think that uh, we can read the Old Testament in general in that way and say that, okay, there is a continuity here. And, and this would, would give us a result like the result you're arriving at. Like we would need something more cl like clearer than this in the Old Testament. What we do find is that there is one speaker who is saying, I am Yahweh, I am the only God, besides me there is no other, and so on. Now if you're saying that there are three Yahwehs, um, then to me this is a problematic interpretation that you're bringing to this text. It, it, is, it is a forced idea. And uh, though they, they, you know, the solution to this puzzle is not clear to me at the moment, I, 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 I'm sure that that is not the solution, that you have three Yahwehs. Okay, so looking at the text then to try to discern who the speaker is, uh, for, it says, For thus said the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations to plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Behold, I will shake my hand over them, and they shall become plunder for those who serve them. Then you will know the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell in your midst, and you shall know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Is, is Yahweh speaking the whole way through that text? Would you not agree? Okay, you know, I lost you there because I'm looking at the New International Version. Um, which version are you looking at? I'm looking at the ESV. E ESV? Correct. Okay, mm -hmm. let, let me look up that um, uh, very quickly. Okay, so ESV, and starting with which verse do you identify the speaker as Yahweh? Um, so starting with verse 6. 
verse number six. So up, up, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord. Okay, so we see it in all caps here, and we know that that's a reference to Yahweh. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, declares uh, the, uh, the Lord, Yahweh again. Uh, up, uh, uh, escape from Zion, to Zion, uh, you will dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after his uh, glory sent me, um, so now we have a different reference here. We have Yahweh Sabaoth. Uh, so Yahweh Sabaoth is now speaking. For thus says the Lord of hosts after his uh, glory sent me uh, uh, to the nations who plundered. So who is his glory? His glory sent me. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you now, like, who is his glory? Ex um, so that verse, I think, is more ambiguous. It could be referring to Yahweh, but it's not it's not clear. Okay, so you admit that there is some ambiguity in the text. If we go through it in more detail, I, I'm sure you will find your, your, the answer to your puzzle there, but the answer will not be that there are three Yahwehs. Okay, but then you, we get to verse 11. It says, many nations should join themselves to the Lord that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst and shall no Lord of hosts to send me to you. It's, it's very continuous. And furthermore, in, in Zechariah 4, it actually says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, and he speaks to, um, speaks to Zechariah, their hand, and it speaks about the word building the foundation for the temple and completing it and so forth. And then it says, and then you will know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. So the word of the Lord has been sent by Yahweh. Okay, so you, you lost me there. You're referring to another text now apart from this Zechariah 2? Yeah, Zechariah 4. Um, no, okay, so now, so, so yeah, so this is my difficulty, Jonathan, with what you have presented. I'm not saying that you haven't studied these texts. You have, and I have not. Um, uh, and, and I, I, you know, I will. I will study these texts in, in detail. Uh, but you cannot, by piecing texts together like this, like you, you know that there's an ambiguity even in this one, Zechariah 2, where there's a, a shift of speaker, there's an ambiguity as to who have exactly is being referred to. And, and you're going to reach the conclusion here that there are three Yahwehs, and one Yahweh is speaking to another Yahweh. And then you're going to join that with Zechariah 4. Whereas you, you have clear statements in the Bible that there is only one Yahweh. Uh, if Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4, start with that. Uh, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Echad. Uh, 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 they, would you agree that Echad there can refer to a composite or compound unity? Well, then, if you take that argument, then we cannot stick with three because it could be a compound of any number. And in any case, anything will be a compound. Like there is one father. So the one father could be a compound father with three, three within the one. Um, and the sun can be a compound sun. There is only one sun, but this is compound. You can have three within the one. But that's not how we interpret text. The word echad in, in, uh, in Hebrew is just a simple counting word. Like we go one, two, three in, in English. It's uh, echad uh, shatayim shalosh. It's one, two, three in, in Hebrew. So why would we go to this extent of saying that this must involve a, a plurality within the unity? You must have another text that clearly states that there is a plural, plural, plurality, plurality within the unity. You cannot just simply, you know, go by inference when you have a clear statement. The inference, as the Quran says, in uh, the la yugni min al haqqi shay'a, they, you know, that they, what is arrived at by inference is not going to overturn the, the clear statement. I mean, the, the word Yahid would be a solitary unity and not allow for a composite unity. But Echad, although it does sometimes refer to a, um, a solitary unity, it often does refer to a compound or composite unity. And it gives several examples in the opening statement. But let, let's go to another passage um, in our remaining minutes. Let's go to Zechariah 9, um, where we have the, um, the um, coming king of Zion, Zechariah 9, uh, chapter, verse 9 through 12. Um, and I mentioned in my opening remarks that the connection with Zechariah 12, where uh, the um, where Yahweh, when he descends with physical feet that touch the men of olives, causing the men to split in two, he and Yahweh is described as being king over all the earth, and yet in Zechariah 9 is actually the messianic king. So does that not imply that the messianic king is himself Yahweh? Uh, I don't see that implication. I see that uh, a lot of what you're describing is that something is uh, is mentioned about Yahweh. And something similar is mentioned about Jesus, and therefore Jesus must be Yahweh. But no, the writers may have in mind that Jesus is the son of Yahweh, and as his son, he is the chip of the old block. He is similar to his father. So similar things can be said about him, but you still have father and son. You don't have God and God. 
you don't have first, second, and per second person of the Holy Trinity. You have father and son in the minds of many of the writers of the Bible. So I think Trinitarian doctrine has to come to grips with this. And that is uh, what um, uh, one of the, I think the first person who asked the question, I wish I could pronounce his name correctly. And I ask his forgiveness for that. Uh, but he made the point uh, very succinctly that, uh, you know, the, the, the Bible does not seem to be fully there with Trinitarian doctrine. Uh, yes, it's not a Muslim um, a document, but it's neither Trinitarian. But it's not merely it's saying that, that it's saying something similar about the Messiah as it says about Yahweh. Rather, it says in, in chapter 14, verse 9, Yahweh will be king over all the earth. On that day, Yahweh will be one and his name one. But in chapter 9, we see that the Messianic king rules as king over all the earth. Um, and so, uh, and it's not simply using language of agency because the um, Messiah actually, it, it, Yahweh in Zechariah 14, rather, Zechariah, it, Yahweh in Zechariah 14 descends and his physical feet touch the Mount of Olives. Now, if he was going to be using the Messiah as an agency, then why does he come himself if he was only going to be using an agent anyway? So it seems to me to very, very strongly suggest that the Messianic King is, is identified as the Lord God. No, there's another explanation for that, uh, because you could have that Yahweh is using a divine ag agency here. He is uh, sending his ambassador and, uh, you know, he can speak of himself as having done what, what the agent is doing. Uh, but we understand this in the sense of divine agency. It doesn't mean that Yahweh equals Jesus. To to say to you know to have a, a, a something so like if you as as you know, there's a standard principle that the the greater the claim, the the more the need for evidence. Uh, if you're claiming that Jesus equals Yahweh, this is a great claim. You need a clear declarative statements for that. If you only have statements which can be interpreted in the in the sense of divine agency uh, and and in a metaphorical manner, like you know you speaking about Yahweh touching down on the Mount of Olives. Obviously, this is a metaphorical statement. Uh, it doesn't mean like within the, um, the bounds of the Old Testament that Yahweh actually physically comes down because the Old Testament cl clearly says right. in Numbers Dr. chapter Lee, our, our time for this, this portion is up. So I'm going sure. to have to interrupt you and we'll flip the script. Okay. And uh, it's, it's now your turn to ask Dr. McClatchy questions. Okay, sure. Uh, so, Dr. McClatchy, uh, and you didn't pay that much attention to uh, the questions of reason, and uh, I would like to draw your attention to some of these uh, issues. So, to begin with, uh, how do you like? How do you regard that entity, which I've referred to as a possible fourth entity, uh, that that the three divine persons are participating in or sharing? Uh, like, you know, if you use the kind of sharing language, I'm thinking of a cake that is cut into three parts. Each one takes a third of the pie. Um, so how do you explain that, that other entity that the three are participating in? So it's, it's uh, not that there's another entity. It's that they, they so when, when I talk about the divine essence, I'm, what I'm talking about is that each of the three divine persons shares those divine attributes, that which makes God God. So being relates to what makes someone what they are. So I'm a human being, you're a human being, that is what we are. But then we're also individual persons. I'm Jonathan, you're Shabir. So um, there's, there's a distinction between being a person and being relates to those attributes, those essential properties that make you that particular type of entity. So a, a God, rather, God rather than a human, for example. Does that make sense? Um, so far as, um, you know, we understand from the human point of view that we are two different persons and, and, and two examples of human beings, but we understand the God to be a sui generis. He's one of a kind. Uh, so when you, when you say that there are three persons, we understand that, uh, and this one is God, this one is God, this one is God, but it's starting to look like three gods. Now, if there isn't a fourth entity that, that contains these three, uh, how do we know that these are not three gods that, that, that somebody's passing off to us as though it were only one God. So uh, this would be an issue of revelation. Scripture informs us that there is one divine being and three divine persons. Um, and uh, so I, I do. I think that I, I I do think that there's any logical incoherence in that concept. But I also don't claim that we can fully understand that concept. But I don't think that we need to fully understand a concept in order to have confidence that it's true. We don't understand quantum physics, for example, but we nonetheless have reason to think that it's true. We don't understand a fourth dimension, for example, but we can try to imitate what a, um, what a four-dimensional hypercube would look like in terms of its shadow in three-dimensional space. It's known as a, a four-dimensional um, hypercube. Its, it's um, shadow is known as a, as a tesseract. 
Um, but we, we can't envision what a fourth dimension would look like because we're trapped in three physical dimensions. Likewise, um, we can't understand fully the essence of God because we're humans and we're, we're not God, but we, cannot, we can still adduce evidence for it by virtue of God's divine revelation of himself. So, um, uh, Jonathan, in the Old Testament, you have the mention of the glory of the Lord, you have the Shekinah of the Lord, you have the Memra, um, the word of the Lord, um, you have Dabar Elohim as well, the, God, the, the speech of the Lord, uh, you have uh, uh, the spirit of, of God, um, you have so many references to things which are apparently divine and connected with God. How can you be confident that all of these different references are, are references to the one divine person that you're calling the, the either the second or the third person of the Holy Trinity? How how could you not be, be how could you be sure uh, that, for example, um, uh, the um, memory of the Lord is is uh, different from uh, the wisdom uh, that is different again from the spirit uh, that is different from the angel of the Lord and so on. Yeah, so I would argue that we can show from texts in the Old Testament that these individuals are, are one. So, for example, um, I mentioned in my opening remarks, Malachi 3, which identifies, um, in my assessment, the, um, the, the messenger of the covenant as the, uh, the Messiah and also as the angel of the Lord. Um, I would argue the Son of Man in Daniel 7 is easily identifiable as the Messiah by virtue of his attributes and prerogatives, his, his um his CV, as it were, matches that given to the Messiah in various other passages in Isaiah and Zechariah and, and elsewhere. Um, and so that, uh, that and I, the, the word of the Lord is also um, equated with uh, the angel of the Lord, as I could show as well. So um, that, that would be the, the basis for, for arguing that. Okay. And what you just said, in some cases, you're speaking about two things being uh, equated. And in some cases, you're speaking about one thing being easily identifiable with the other thing. So I want to pick up on the easily identifiable, because where it's easily identifiable, it seems that you have no certainty. So I would ask you again, on what grounds can you be certain that there are only three persons in the divine uh, Godhead, um, uh, apart from the philosophical argument which you have already put forward? Well, I, I'm not claiming epistemic certainty in the, in the sort of rigorous mathematical sense, um, but I'm claiming to, to have um, what you might call moral certainty in, in terms of the meaning of scripture. Um, I, um, I, um, so are, are you, so and, and I, I think that the evidence strongly suggests that there is a plurality of divine persons, which is very, um, not very consistent with Tawheed, but very consistent with my own view. And um, I think that there is very strong passages that indicate the identity between, say, the angel of the Lord and the Messiah, uh, between the Son of Man and the Messiah, and so forth. And so it collapses into, th into three di divine persons. And also you have um, the progressive revelation of the New Testament, which then provides further illumination into what's going on, on in the Bible. And since I accept the New Testament as, uh, as um, authoritative, um, I therefore would interpret it through that lens in any case. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we, we think now about the... Um, the humanity of uh, of Jesus. So Jesus was a human, and uh, at the same time, um, you say that he was divine. <clears throat> so the question is, how does humanity and divinity um, uh, coincide? Like in the, in the episode of the fig tree, Jesus uh, has the power to curse the fig tree uh, and make it wither. Uh, but John, uh, Mark Gospel says that uh, Jesus uh, that it was not the season for figs. So I, I infer from this that had it been the season for figs, uh, the tree would have grown uh, fruit, but Jesus did not realize it was not the season for figs. So how does the, the power of the Almighty cooperate uh, with the lack of knowledge of the human here uh, to curse this fig tree, which otherwise appears to be a good tree? How do you explain that? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, the, the, um, in Mark, Mark 11, which you just alluded to, um, verse 12, through 14, where Jesus curses the fig tree, um, is actually alluding to the, the Old Testament in Jeremiah 8.13. There's other passages that are in view here as well. But Jeremiah 8.13 is probably the clearest. When I would gather them, speaking about the nation of Israel, declares the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered, and what I gave them has passed away from them. So it's actually drawing um, 
this, this parallel between Jesus who was inspecting the nation of Israel for figs and finding no figs, just as Yahweh had inspected the nation of Israel for figs in the Old Testament and found no figs but only leaves. Um, and so it's actually, I, I think, pointing to the deity of Christ rather than detracting from it. Um, you asked about the interplay between uh, Jesus' human nature and his divine nature. Can I actually clarify what, what exactly you're getting at there? So what I'm trying to understand is that since Mark says very plainly, it was, plainly that it was not the season for figs, and Jesus uh, seeing that, uh, you know, seeing that the fig tree had leaves, uh, he went to it to see if perhaps he might find uh, fruit on it. And when he didn't find fruit, uh, he cursed the tree. So it would look like we're dealing here with a hungry man uh, who, from a distance, sees the tree uh, in leaf, thinks that, OK, I'll find some figs there to eat. He doesn't find any figs. He curses the tree. But it seems that it was no fault of the tree. The tree just didn't have fruit yet because it was not the season for figs, according to Mark's gospel. And so uh, wouldn't this mean that, that the, the power, which obviously comes from God to curse that tree, um, was somehow cooperating with the lack of knowledge from the human element here? Uh, and, and is that how you conceive of God operating in the world through Jesus? Yeah, so what you have going on here is um, this deliberate echo of the Old Testament, and Jesus is trying to, um, uh, it, um, through this uh, uh, object lesson, reveal him, reveal his identity, um, and reveal also the hypocrisy of the nation, because it's bearing leaves out of season, and yet it has no fruit. Um, as to, so, so you mentioned, um, so it says in the following day, when he, they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance of a tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. Um, and that's, of course, written from the perspective of Mark, who probably is, is basing his material on the eyewitness testimony of the Apostle Peter. So that's how it appeared to the, the, to the uh, Mark source um, in, in regards to um, Jesus uh, approaching the fig tree. Um, it doesn't necessarily imply that, uh, that he was ignorant of, of the fact that it wasn't the season for figs. Um, it, um, it could just be that he was giving an, an object lesson. But even if we suppose that he is ignorant, um, uh, then th that's perfectly understandable in, in view of his human nature, because we understand Christ not ever just a divine nature, but also a human nature. And it's possible that in, in one could conceive of that as God having in his, uh, or Christ having in his um, um, subconscious knowledge, um, exhaustive knowledge, but in his waking conscious knowledge, having limited knowledge and certain things that he's ignorant of. So, so, so God uh, can also, like Jesus, right. have a Dr. Lee. I'm I'm sorry, but that is that is our full time okay. for the the cross examination time. So sure. I'm going to have to cut you off there, and we'll move into our final uh, component to the debate, which is five minutes of closing statements. And maybe just as a as a word of yeah, I guess just caution to you. It, Five minutes. I think you've been giving much longer speeches, and it will probably go by very quickly. So I'd encourage you to keep it to, to concise summaries, <laughs> so I don't have to get, so I don't have to come in again. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you both very much. And Dr. McClatchy, this is the floor is yours. All right. Well, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Shabir Ali for engaging in this uh, friendly discussion about these, this very important topic. Uh, just to remind you of where I. Uh, the, the arguments I provided in my opening statement. So I presented the Trinity and Talmud as two competing models. The Trinity is the proposition that there's one divine essence and three distinct persons that together share in that divine essence. Talhid is the idea, the, prop, the proposition of, that God is absolutely one, both with respect to being in person. And I um, asked the question, which of these models best accounts for all the relevant data? Um, because Islam and Christianity both claim to be continuations of the Abrahamic tradition. And so therefore, both of those re respective religions, Islam and Christianity, predict that their concept of God is consistent with that revealed by the Hebrew Bible. And thus, uh, we have to consider which of those two models uh, best accounts for the data in the Hebrew Bible. And I've looked at, um, we, we are in agreement with Shabir that the Old Testament is very emphatic about monotheism. We see that in Deuteronomy 6.4, we see it in Zappos 2 verse 10, we see it in many other texts as well. Um, I pointed out that the Hebrew word it had allows for, though it does not require, a composite or compound unity. And when we look at um, various passages in the Old Testament, such as in Zechariah 2 um, and um, Isaiah 48, and we can talk about other passages as well. Um, we can talk about um, Hosea 1 7, we can talk about Isaiah, um, and Proverbs 30, verse 4, um, Isaiah 63, verse 7 through 10. We see this. Uh, this plurality of divine persons being expressed in the Old Testament. We've seen 
how the how the Messiah is indicated to be a divine person. We, um, we're seeing the Son of Man, uh, for instance, in Daniel 7, 13, and 14, who is afforded the travel the very highest form of worship and religious service. It's, although it's used eight other times in the book of Daniel, it, it always denotes a, a religious service to a deity. Uh, we've seen um, how the words of Darius concerning the God of Daniel are applied to the Son of Man in Daniel 7, 13. We've seen how um, in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, the um, the Messiah that's to be born as a child um, is called the mighty God. He's called the wonderful counselor. He's called the father of eternity. These are titles that could only be applied to a divine person. And we've seen um, um, Zechariah 9 and its relationship to Zechariah 14 and Zechariah 3, that, that the whole thrust of the Old Testament, it presents a divine Messiah who, um, who, who uh, is God, who's God incarnate the second person of the triune Godhead, we also saw the, old, the, the Holy Spirit as well, um, throughout the, the pages of the Old Testament, who's represented as a distinctive identity, and yet also a personal agency. And, and in uh, we, um, uh, Shabir has um, tried to uh, cast doubt on the, uh, the strength of the portrayal in both the Old and New Testaments of the divine Messiah, of the divine Christ, and I think that we've seen quite clearly that the the New Testament um, is very, very clear, and the Old Testament is very, very clear that the Messiah is divine, is a divine person. He actually shares completely and fully in the divine attributes. He is he's described as God. He is, um, John 1, again, says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was, with, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And we've seen, we see in, John, in verse 14 that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, glories of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so in the person of Christ, God broke into human history, and, um, and uh, upon the cross, he actually absorbed the judgment of God so that we could be legally acquitted for a just and holy God, because we violated God's law and broken his commandments and um, and so we are, uh, we stand guilty before a just and holy God, and God being holy cannot simply forgive sin. He must condemn the guilty. But in the person of Christ, God, uh, Christ consumed upon himself the judgment of God that was destined for us so that we could be legally acquitted before a just and holy God, that we could be declared forensically righteous so that when God looks upon us, he sees that imputed righteousness and purity of Christ, and Christ bore our judgment and our guilt and our shame um, and our penalty upon the cross of Calvary, such that if we trust in Christ and repent of our sins and uh, throw ourselves at the foot of the cross, um, then God will be gracious towards us and God will give us eternal life because Christ um, has died in our place. And so I'll close with that and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. McClatchy. And uh, Dr. Ali, you will have five minutes to make your final statements as well. Oh, I apologize, you're muted again. <laughs> Is there? All right. No, ready to go. There you go, yep. So folks, as we come to the end, uh, let me pull together the various um, strands of thought that has permeate, have permeated uh, our discussion throughout all of these uh, ups and downs with various speakers back and forth. So one of the key ideas here is uh, about Jesus being uh, that uh, a person of the Holy Trinity who died uh, in our place. So uh, this uh, does not make much sense because if uh, we, we have somebody who is an intermediary between us and God, who then uh, somehow bears the penalty on our uh, behalf or, uh, you know, or becomes the uh, object of God's wrath in, in our place, this has to be someone distinct from God. Uh, so it cannot be uh, the Godhead itself. It cannot be one of the persons within the Godhead. Otherwise, it'll be God penalizing God for the sins of humankind. And that doesn't make much uh, sense. Uh, and if we say that this was God's son, still it does not make much sense, even though I have uh, allowed that many of the New Testament writers regard Jesus as the son of God. But to say that God uh, took out his wrath on his son uh, instead of us, it would be like an angry father uh, returning home from work, angry with the world, and then he takes it out on his family. That doesn't look very good for God either. 
Uh, and then if we think about Jesus dying on the cross, and he's the second person of the Holy Trinity, then who ruled the world when he was dead? It would mean that the second person of the Holy Trinity is expendable, and by definition, God is not expendable, therefore Jesus is not God. Thinking about the fig tree episode, we realize that uh, Jesus uh, would have, according to Jonathan, two levels of awareness. There is a latent awareness, and then there is a conscious awareness. But that would make uh, Jesus, as God, uh, one who is not omniscient in his consciousness. It's, it's in a pre-consciousness or latent consciousness that he has this omniscience, but he, it, it's not the knowledge uh, that, that he has in the forefront of his mind. It's like almost like I know something, but it's in the back of my mind. But if you ask me now, I have to confess I don't know it. So I, that means I'm confessing my ignorance. So we cannot have uh, the, like the idea that God would be like this, and uh, at a moment he would not know something. Uh, like he wouldn't know that the fig tree was not uh, in its right season to bear figs. I think this is uh, too much to, to speak of God in this way. And then we have Jesus declaring that he does not know when the hour will occur. So that would prove that he's not the omniscient uh, God. As for the mention of Latrua that came up in the question period, it was good that Munib Zia brought this up. Uh, and then um, uh, Jonathan said, well, well, you know, okay, so I admit in that one place Latrua is used for other than God. Well, then that just breaks the seal and, and shows that you don't have a an airtight argument uh, here. As for John chapter 1, verse 1, notice there that uh, uh, John's gospel is not saying that Jesus is God. He is uh, using God in the third stanza as a qualitative word, meaning something like God-like or divine. Otherwise, you would have, if you think of X, uh, X was with Y and X was Y, uh, then, you know, it makes no sense, <laughs> Other, uh, unless you're using why in a different sense in the second instance. And this is what we find in John's gospel. So there's no clear, simple declaration in John's gospel that Jesus is God. We, we have vague statements which have to be interpreted to mean that he is God. But in the Old Testament, in Numbers chapter 23, verse number 19, it already said, God is not a man. So when uh, Jesus appears, and he's obviously a man to in appearance, nobody should think that he is God. God. And uh, you would need a simple, clear declarative statement to um, uh, declare that he is God. And then we would have to try to reconcile that. But because we don't have a, a, such a statement, there is no need to go through all of these loops to join this text with that text, with the other text, with the other text, to make it mean the opposite of what simple, clear declarative texts like Numbers 23, 19 have already said uh, uh, to us. As for Titus 2, chapter uh, thir verse number 13, you rely here on a Grenville Sharp rule, uh, but you cannot use that to get you a text that then contradicts the simple, clear declarative statements in other passages. Uh, notice also that Titus is a late document and probably a pseudonymous one, according to many uh, scholars. So uh, when we come to the end of this discussion, folks, I think we need to remind ourselves of where we began. We want to build bridges, understanding. We want to discuss this in mutual love and understanding. Let's learn more. Let's study more and come to understand that God is a uh, as, a, as a unity. He's one God. The Unitarian view of uh, the Bible is, to me, the, the preferred one, and that uh, coincides with the Muslim view of Tawheed, of the oneness of God. I thank you. I'm so glad we had this discussion today. Thank you both very much, and thank you to all of you who were here and asked good questions, and um, I this concludes our event, but thank you. Thank you to Dr. McClatchy and Dr. Ali, and let's give them a Zoom round of applause. You can find the, <laughs> the little uh, clap your hand reactions. Show your appreciation that way. <laughs> thank you all and uh, have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Shabir. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Bryant. You guys have been gracious. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Absolutely. It was, a, it was a treat. Let's do it again. Indeed. Another time. <laughs> Not back to back. <laughs> okay. All the best. And, uh, God protect you all. You too. And, and uh, enjoy your grandchildren. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. I'll keep my name as Shabir Ali though. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> until, right. until the next Zoom meeting. Until the next, <laughs> until the next debate. Yes. Okay. All the best.